Havich here. Musikowski here. Sleeper here. Chandler here. Would everybody please take a look at the minutes of July 24th and see if there's any corrections, omissions, or Mayor, overall comments. There was one uh, error that was corrected, brought to my attention earlier today. So if you go to page 19, under the plan review, we changed it so that Alderman Gusikowski didn't make a motion and second it. We have Alderman Gusikowski making the motion and Commissioner Hanna seconding. Okay. With that. Whenever you are ready, Commission, a motion. Mr. Kowski, you'll make the uh, a motion to approve the July 24th, 2018 uh, minutes as amended. And a second. Roll call. And aye. And aye. Roll aye. Bark abstains. Avich aye. Mr. Kowski aye. Deepert abstains. Chandler abstains. Uh, sign Just counting bodies here. Uh, significant common council actions. Carry. Council had another 8 and 18 approval of an ordinance to approve the rezone of the properties at 7781 and 7811 South 13th Street to B4 Highway Business and a portion of 7869 South 13th Street to I1 Institutional. An ordinance to amend the conditions and restrictions in Ordinance 2399 for a conditional use permit for an animal boarding kennel slash dog daycare facility with outsize outdoor exercise area at 8411 South Liberty Lane. An ordinance to repeal and recreate Section 17.0325 of the Municipal Code to specify and clarify permitted and conditional uses within a planned unit development and to renumber subsequent sections accordingly. A resolution approving a certified survey map for Michael Faber, Ryan Business Park for the property at 741 West Ryan Road. A resolution approving another certified survey map for R Michael Faber, Ryan Business Park for the property at 9900 South 13th Street. Another resolution approving a certified survey map for Michael Faber, Ryan Business Park for the property at 9600 South 13th Street. A resolution approving a final certified survey map for Michael Faber Ryan Business Park for the properties at 741 West Ryan Road and 9600, 9700, and 9900 South 13th Street, and an ordinance amending the boundaries of the designated nature center at 10,025 South Shepherd Avenue. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, we will get on with our new business, and that brings us to item 5A, and that is consideration of conditional use permit requested by Dragon. Redata M&M &M Towing for a conditional use permit for towing a full-service truck maintenance and sales facility and outdoor storage of vehicles and, a, and equipment on the property, 8940 South 27th Street. Gary. There was a change to the property owner's um, business name. So they are now known as uh, M&M Truck Center, I believe. So please make a note of that. This is for the property that's highlighted in red on the screen. It is along 27th Street. This application was actually held at the July 24th meeting at the request of the applicant to provide a little bit more information that was requested by staff. On your screen now is a site plan for the proposal, which I will now describe. It is for a full service maintenance and sales facility, which would include light duty maintenance, tire service, oil changes, and similar services. It would also include some office space, warehouse space, and truck parking. Based on a letter received July 20th, there was also a request for outdoor storage and display of five trucks for sale. And in a supplemental letter received and dated August 9th, there was some more information regarding the services provided. That would include engine tune-ups, suspension work, and potentially classic, course start, classic car storage for a potential tenant. No freight terminal or transshipment depot operations and no towing operations are proposed at this time. Automobile and truck engine and body repairs, storage of vehicles and equipment, and truck parking are conditional uses in the M1 manufacturing district. The proposed hours of operation are 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday and 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Saturdays, approximately 15 employees, and 2 to 10 mechanics could be on site at any given time. There are no proposed additions or exterior alterations to the existing structure proposed. 
There have been some changes to the proposal since the staff report was written. There are now proposed 38 tractor trailer parking stalls in the site plan. The display of vehicles for sale has been reduced from five to four, still in the same location, however. And there is car parking potentially for up to 60 vehicles on the property. This is all behind, except with the exception of the car parking on the west, this is all behind a fence. The original request included temporary parking of licensed and registered equipment. However, in the letter dated July 20th, only trucks, trailers, and cars would be parked on site. The minimum parking requirements for office space, one stall for every 250 square feet of gross floor area, plus one stall per peak shift employee. Warehousing requires one stall for every 5,000 square feet of gross floor area, plus one stall per peak shift employee. Therefore, a minimum of 60 to 68 parking stalls would be required, and as previously mentioned, 60 vehicle parking stalls are shown on the plan. There is an existing chain link fence, and it is proposed to be augmented with a six-foot-tall vinyl privacy slat added along the west and south. And as mentioned in the staff report, there are several concerns that staff raised with regard to this proposal. First, this is located with within the 27th Street Overlay District, including the mixed-use office overlay district. The specific proposed uses, with the exception of the office component, are prohibited in the mixed-use office overlay district. And as with any parcel in the 27th Street Overlay District, compliance with both, both the base zoning and the overlay district are required. This property is also located within South Branch, South Branch Industrial Park. That PUD specifically prohibits outdoor storage. There was a similar proposal by the applicant for the same property presented to the Planning Commission in 2014, and based on discussion and comments from the Planning Commission at that time, the applicant was allowed to withdraw the request during the meeting. The historic use of the property has changed. Um, it's a little bit different than what I think was the interpretation before. In 1995, the Plan Commission made a determination that the proposed truck and equipment sales and repair uses for Nineman were permitted, therefore no special or conditional use was granted. Outdoor storage was specifically excluded from that determination, meaning if there was any outdoor storage proposed, they would have to come back to the Plan Commission, and that was specifically stated during that review. There was no further review, and there was no further approval, so there's nothing in the file that would ever grant a specific use approval or any kind of grandfathering status for that use. The property has not been used for truck and equipment sales and repair for more than a decade, and the municipal code has changed in accordance with statu statutory requirements since that 1995 determination. There all are also some outstanding um, considerations. One is that there would be a requirement to have the building sprinklered and although there is a well and holding tank mentioned in the uh, submission materials, there is a special assessment um, that will be um, for water and sewer utility purposes. Um, the applicant is aware of this requirement. And finally, we received an email on August 8th um, requesting or stating that a request to rezone the property would be forthcoming. So the correct procedure in this case would be to hear the proposal for a rezone excuse me, first, and then come back for a conditional use permit. Should the council ultimately approve the district, that, was, that would be the point at which the plan commission could review the proposed conditional use and then grant it based on the change to the zoning district should the use be allowed. And that's where the, uh, the process becomes very important, and we ask that the plan commission consider that. And while staff recognize and appreciate that there is an existing conflict between the base and the overlay zoning districts, we are transitioning from the, com the comprehensive plan update at the end of the year to looking at the zoning and providing a zoning code update. And this information was presented to the applicant. So there may be a change to the zoning at that time. However, we understand there is a time frame consideration for the applicant, which is why we're here tonight. And we hope to um, address and resolve conflicts such as these in the, in the zoning code wherever we can. That process is anticipated to be completed at the end of 2019 for your information. 
And for the reasons that was, were just stated and were included in your staff reports, there is a suggested motion that the Planning Commission does not recommend that the Common Council approve the conditional use permit as presented. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, I receive nobody wishing to speak on the subject of this, but if there's any, but you'd like to? Okay. Uh, yeah, other than the applicant. Oh, come on up before we uh, put it to the commission. Good evening, uh, Joe Sincott. I'm an attorney in Milwaukee. Solo practitioner. I've practiced in this area, land use and such. And um, Mr. Radata here is with me at the presentation table. Thank you for hearing this tonight. Thank you for putting it over last time. And also thank you for letting me interact some with your counsel, Ms. Carls, which has been very helpful. And um, based on some of my interaction with her, I've submitted several correspondence, uh, a lot to read. I think it's generally properly summarized by um, staff, Ms. Papelbon, um, with um, my overlay, if you will, pardon the pun, on it, which I'll give you now. Um, RD Invest is the actual owner. Mr. Radat is the representative. Uh, this has um, become, uh, it was a bit more, but it's primarily a truck repair operation. I think we know what that looks like. Um, I, I say that because there's been a f some desire to have more detail about how it'll operate, and we've tried to provide that. But I think that's, as she stated, that's, that's what we're, where we're at now. We're not going to have towing. Uh, there's no outside storage of anything, much less anything flammable or uh, dangerous or environmentally sensitive. Mr. Radata is a representative of a company that has a very similar operation in Sturdivant. Um, he started the process a while back there, recently received his approval, and is now working with DOT to get their um, okay to start uh, operating uh, and repairing those vehicles. As stated, it's a repair for trucks and trailers, no towing. Recently, we had uh, an offer by a classic car owner or operation to rent some space inside the existing facility. I think part of this is the existing facility is a couple of them that we don't need to use at all. So there's a desire to also make some of that space available for lease. Um, some of the detail, 38 truck spots, four trucks for sale, 60 parking spots, that's all correct. We understand about the sprinkler, happy to do that. Um, not maybe happy, but certainly an understanding, and we will take that on and understand the special assessment on the sewer and water. Uh, the company has owned the property and or Mr. Radata has owned the property for a while now. Some details that I think are pertinent uh, from a private property use standpoint. I think it's appropriate to think a little bit about this given the overlay district, the, the complex of regulations that do exist. Um, since purchase, we've had uh, contact with over nine potential uh, tenants, customers, barrel equipment, rentals equipment. We've gone over these in the past, air and equipment. Uh, those have, have not been able to be realized um, at this point. Um, and our indications are that the city has not been um, interested or finding that those would be suitable. So there's been, I guess, the point being some real effort to try to make the property um, useful again and productive. Uh, as stated, it's been sitting for a while. These uh, potential tenants were all secured by a commercial broker, and we can give more details on that. But I say that for the record, that there's been an effort to try to make the property uh, useful. The costs um, for the property last year were $80,000. Uh, that's for property taxes, loan payment, painting, and cleaning of the property. Property's not useful It's uh, right now if we can't get an approval. So we're, we're, we're really starting to spend a lot to try to make this uh, work for ourselves. Um, the, ex the estimation is that the ex operating expense will be about 60000 if it remains vacant and unusable. So I think some pertinent facts for the record. Um, the M1 district is the underlying primary, what I'll call primary zoning district. Um, I think that the use being proposed is certainly allowed in the M1, maybe even expressly allowed, but we're happy to get a conditional use permit, which we've applied for, and have some uh, sensible conditions put on the operation. Uh, under an M1 um, or perspective, under an M1 regulation. The problem we've run into is this overlay district, and a um, substantial amount of my submittal has been sort of legal, which is what we tend to do as lawyers sometimes. 
Uh, in summary, we don't think it applies, for the reasons I've explained in my letters. I don't expect, and I don't think it's probably useful to have a long argument about that here, but I did put that in the record because I needed to preserve that argument for the property owner and the client. What, um, and I do note as part of that, that the district, there's no use variances allowed um, under the overlay district that I could see. So we've explained that in our, in our submittal, and um, that's where that is from a legal standpoint. But as I've done this enough times, you're looking for solutions, you're looking for compromise. Thus, I've had some interaction with uh, the attorney. And while we preserve and reserve our right to make that argument about the overlay district, we would be more than happy to have this property rezoned to essentially remove the overlay district and allow it to go back to its fundamental rezoning of Amendment 1. And I think if that happened, this would be a much easier um, process and a much more uh, obtainable permit uh, because of that. Again, I think it makes sense in the M1. I'll elaborate a little bit. I understand the purpose of overlay districts having done some of this work. This one, as noted, is quite inconsistent in many respects with the underlying zoning. What I think is also reasonable to consider is it's a very inconsistent with the historic uses. And so what we find is from our perspective, and we submit an affidavit, to try to change this use and this dwelling into an office type use would be prohibitive from a cost standpoint. Um, that may be a, a desirable goal on behalf of the city, um, but I think in this case, because of the, uh, I don't know if extreme is the word, but because of the, the, the significant difference between what's there now to what would be a suitable, acceptable, permittable office use, it just isn't economically feasible. So we're trying to make a, a go of this property and using it in a way that it has been historically used, um, although we're not arguing that it's grandfathered in, it in any formal sense. But it has been used for truck repair in the past. And we want to do that operation in a very respectful and good way. Um, so in summary, we'd, we'd like the alternative. We'd like to have the city consider a rezoning of this property while also preserving our, you know, our claim that it's not applicable, the overlay district. But we'd like to have that considered. And I, coming to this realization and having discussions with the city I, uh, attorney, I have then submitted a more recent correspondence referenced by staff that suggests that the, the body tonight could look at this from a rezoning standpoint. It's a little unorthodox. I'm just going to make a little bit of record, and then I'll, I'll let you go. The reason I think it's okay, if you will, to think about it from a rezoning standpoint is many of, if not all, of the facts that are pertinent, I think, to that analysis are in front of the body. And I, now I'm not asking for a rezoning beyond what is sort of already exists, the M1, which is the underlying zone. This is really about moving the, forward pro moving the process forward more quickly. We can certainly reapply for the rezoning that ends up being the decision. We say, look, staff says we can't consider rezoning tonight. We don't get the, the conditional because of the overlay. Sorry, reapply. I'm kind of expecting that. I would prefer that we don't do that. We use our time tonight and we look at it and we move it forward to the council and we kind of put them in tandem, a rezoning and a conditional use permit. I've seen that a lot. That happens a lot. So I do think it's reasonable to try to address the rezoning tonight uh, but I understand staff feels procedurally it's uh, we're not in the right posture. So I acknowledge that. But for the reasons I've stated, I think it would be um, acceptable and permitted under the statutes and the law that I am familiar with for the body to, if not formally, at least discuss this proposal from a rezoning standpoint so the record is available. That could be helpful in guiding the proponent and staff and also could then be useful if the council were to decide to take up the rezoning itself um, at the next meeting. I believe on the South Branch, small things, we're not having outdoor storage, so I think we're fine there. Um, we did withdraw the previous request uh, and then came back um, and have tried to provide a modified request that we think fits under the M1. So in summary, overlay district is a barrier. We don't think it applies. Um, you could either decide that, that I, you're, I'm right, which would be great, 
And if not, we'd like to look at a rezoning, basically pulling that overlay district off. Going back to the M1, under the M1, I think we're, we're acceptable. We're happy to uh, have conditions. You think it's okay to look at the rezoning tonight in tandem with the conditional use? And we'll keep on this. Uh, the end of 2019 is a long time from now when you're carrying that property. So that's why we're trying to get the rezoning a little bit accelerated for this property um, as an alternative. So that's a lot. I appreciate it. I'm available for questions, but substantively on the facts of the property, Mr. Radata is also available. I don't know if that's part of this plan presentation, but we are available to answer further questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, this time I'll open it up to the commission. Brad, looks like you want to start. I'll start rezoning, Carrie. If we do look at rezoning, how does that affect our comprehensive planning that we have right now? Would just that be just keep in mind, it's not on the docket tonight to I rezone. It's, just, it's, it's conditional use, so we're going to start blurring lines here. Well, I'm just so. asking, though, know, if, if we do look at rezoning, though, would we try to follow the new plan for the comprehensive plan? Right now, we have not gotten far enough in the comprehensive plan update to say whether or not there would be a change to the comprehensive plan in that area. So we have to go by what we have in place right now. So if we were to entertain a rezoning and staff would have to look at the proposal and then act accordingly, um, I do not believe that the comprehensive plan would be something that we need to look at, at least in the update process as, as stated right now. Okay. We're just curious. Yeah, it's it's a funny thing because what we have is two zoning. We have an overlay going on a existing zoning, going on an existing zoning, and the conditional uses don't don't apply to one another. Um, so we really have to look at the overall plan. And I, I think it was a good question to ask well, future just, where we're going. Right, you kind so, of like a look ahead, though. Without a doubt, we don't want to have to redo this do and do a carve out because. Potentially, this one would be okay. Well, then the next one, right. the next one, that, that was the point of the overlay plan. Um, and how they fit. So, anyways. Okay. Thank you. Jossie? Yes. I, I have a question for Carrie. So, do we have any other properties that have been granted this type of use in, in this area for oh. this year? Or recently, let's say. In this recently. area, no. Okay. And, and perhaps maybe just a clarification of that. I, in, in, again, not to blur the lines between the base zoning and, and Mr. Sincata referred to as the primary zoning. It's, that's maybe a, a little bit misleading. It's, it's the base zoning. So the, rather than implying that it has, it has more jurisdiction than the overlay, it's not, not correct. It's, but... The overlay district of the office overlay, and we, I think Mr. Sakata did a really good job of pointing out some of the incongruencies between the base zoning and the overlay zoning. But th this request, in essence, would be, uh, if, if they should decide to follow up on it, would be to remove the overlay and retain the base zoning district. A little bit different from the perspective, say, you've got a property maybe that's zoned A1 and you, you want to rezone it to M1 with a conditional use permit for truck repair and our sales and service because right now we're actually removing an overlay which isn't typical and I would say that uh, I'm not aware of any cases that we uh, did actually remove the overlay uh, from the properties in this area certainly there are other uses that are similar in nature within the South Branch Industrial Park I think that but uh, something procedurally and with some of the the inconsistencies with the base zoning versus the overlay, I would say that this is probably uh, without a peer right now uh, in terms of any proposals that are ongoing in the South Branch Industrial Park. Then I have a question for the applicant. Can you provide a little more information on the specifics of your conditional use? Because I believe I heard outdoor storage is not a request anymore. I just want to know the specifications of what you're looking for. Okay, um, I just want to kind of make a comment on a previous your question. Oh, please uh, provide there, your name and address for okay, the record. My, my name is Dragan Radeta, mm -hmm. uh, 7228 South 27th Street. Um, 
recently, like two months ago, it was a similar operation was granted in a Southbridge Industrial Park uh, on a Ridgeway Drive. And uh, you guys are familiar with it for sure. And we pointed out that to um, city clerks as well. Uh, as far as outside storage, we will not have a equipment laying around. Everything will be waiting for any kind of you know, maintenance or repairs for customers. So it will be every single piece of equipment will be registered. It will be, you know, there's gonna get, not gonna be like wrecked equipment, you know, damaged equipment, you know. I mean, everything will be, you know, good standing equipment uh, with licensed and uh, it's not gonna be storage. So, you know, I, ju I just wanna point out, you guys are not missing, you know, Taking, you know, parking of the trucks is not the storage, it's parking. So that those are two different things. Storage is if you, st if you store something for like, you know, 10 years and, you know, you don't care about it. You know, this is parking, not, not, the, not the storage. Okay, so you're just looking for outdoor parking? That is correct, yes, ma'am. Parking of what exactly? Uh, Semi-trucks and trailers. Trucks. We do operation in the sturdy one where we have a maintenance for trucks and trailers. And that's the same thing what we want to do here, you know, just to be repair facility, same like Freightliner, it's up on the street on 27th Street, on a Ryan Road or Kenworth or Peterbilt, you know, like exact same operation what they have there. Or Chudel Trailer, which is, you know, just behind of this property, and they have like over 200 trailers, you know, on their parking lot. So it will be exactly the same, same operation as uh, the other companies around. So, so when you say parking, that just overnight for per truck? Ma'am, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, you know, let's say if we, if we wait for part for, you know, five days or, you know, I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure how long it'll be, you know, but it's not long term, you know, again, people are not buying equipment to, you know, to have them parked in a, in a yard. They buy equipment. This is, you know, each truck is called, you know, it's like $150,000. So no one would buy, a, you know, piece of equipment and have them parked, sit, you know, at the someone else's yard. There's just, you know, I mean, you know, they, they'll be there, you know, for maintenance, for repairs, whatever it need to be, and, you know, they'll head out. So, you know, who is going to stay and how long they're going to stay, I, I, I don't know. Okay. But, you know, they're not going to be there for, you know, five months. So they'll be in and out, you know. I'm not sure how long they're going to stay for. Okay. And then we also had a, as part of that conditional use, outside display of vehicles for sale that not an option anymore that is an option oh, okay. still but those are you know exact same situation what you know freightliner has you know they have a, you know display of their vehicles and what i'm proposing originally we're not gonna screen that but you know after you know talking to city and you know we agree that you know put all those equipment behind the screen you know right now entire back end parking lot is a uh, fenced in so and you know i'm willing to add you know, six foot high privacy fence on a, you know, next to that uh, existing fence. So, you know, realistically, you know, I'm willing to screen majority of this operation. You know, and based on, you know, from outside point, we are not gonna do any changes, any, any you know, like we're not adding anything. We're not taking anything off of the existing building. Thank you. Chris, as long as I'm heading right, Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think that from my perspective, you know, this falls in uh, my district, so I really love to see that um, property resurrected in some fashion. It's how we get there is, is the question. Um, I guess I wish you know, on the front end earlier on that um, we had an opportunity to talk before this or maybe a year ago since you've been working on so long, um, but I didn't hear from applicants at all on this, but I'm just me mentioning that if we can somehow find a way to make this work, it's how do we get there? Because I understand where staff is at right now with um, the, the non-recommendation. All right, we're gonna run this way. Who wants to kick it off? Anything, Christina? Um. I guess from what I heard, all the questions and answers, the only thing that I would uh, recommend is, believe it or not, just because it has been a while, is to go through the zoning, even though it may not be applicable. 
but just going through the proper channels that will actually sort the things out and you may find yourself in a better place. Thank you. Brian? It's more of a procedural thing, and I don't know, can you cut out a piece of the overlay for a property? Does that mean it's continuous? We would have to look at the overlay district as a sum of its parts. So just as we had discussed about the overlay district, um, a separate overlay district that was up near Rawson Avenue, you'll recall that that overlay district was amended it was not removed, and there were not parcels taken out of it. What we would be talking about, as I think Director Seymour had said, we would be looking at the overlay district itself and looking at possibly removing it in its entirety if we were to look at a rezone, rather than trying to take out a piece of property in the middle of it, which could be considered spot zoning. Is that Brian? Yes. Uh, Don? Greg? Uh, more a comment than a question. I would just kind of echo what, what's been said. I don't know that I'd feel comfortable notching out the overlay district at this time. I think it would be more appropriate to start with the rezoning and go through the process that way versus us kind of overriding staff and starting to notch out pieces of the map. Um, I'm going to be redundant in my comments. I Christine, I think you hit it right on the head, and Greg, you repeated it. Um, I, I really think, as staff said, you rezone first, you do the conditional use second. If you recall, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, staff, but we had a, a parcel on the other end of town, um, specifically off of Rawson Avenue, where we conditional use permitted first for the rezone on the storage in the, in the light like manufacturing, we didn't follow the procedure correctly, and no. it turned into a mess. I, I guess I that's where think, I'm going. <laughs> I think that one actually went through the rezone first. Did it, it go through, through first? It went through the conditional use permit second, and it actually was held, so that conditional use permit process was never completed. But it did go through the rezone okay. first. E either way, it was a mess. Uh, we're Again, it was one of those things that was rather new to us with the light manufacturing zoning. Um, I think it's prudent to follow staff's recommendation and go through the procedures on this. I also think an amendment to the overlay. We've dealt with the overlay in two occasions that I can remember, the Ridge Church and uh, the corner of Rawson Avenue and 27th. So um, this overlay district was put down for a reason. Uh, citing historical stuff, yeah, we get it, but the city's changing. That's why we're looking at our comprehensive plan to be leaner, uh, make sure we're getting the best, highest value out of what we're doing, uh, particularly as, as the city's evolving and changing. So uh, I think it's prudent. I know it, it's inconvenient on the applicant to take the extra time, but I, I, I think if we're going to work through it, as Chris has suggested, it's probably the right way to go. So. Any other questions or comments? Uh, go ahead. Appreciate all the comments. Uh, we'll take them to heart, and uh, we're, we're going to do our best to get this done. So, uh, Great. Thank you. Great, I, and again, we got we got great staff. Um, they're really the strength of where we are, so uh, they're not going to lead you in the wrong place. So, uh, with that motion, um, if, oh, I, can, if I can make a, a suggestion, yes. since there was a request to rezone the property, might I suggest that the plan commission consider holding this item until that rezone process has been completed, rather than voting it? If that's the cleanest way, I appreciate the suggestion. Can they redraw, I mean, uh, pull back the request right now and just put it on hold? Um, I think we just motion to hold because or it's on the agenda. If you make a motion to hold. Okay. I'll make that motion then. Chandler, second. Uh, roll call. Anna, aye. Johnston, aye. Hello, aye. Lorik, aye. Kavich, aye. Wysikowski, aye. Seepert, aye. Chandler, aye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, item 5B, uh, it is a request submitted by... Beldar Dulai, uh, the Sikh Temple of Wisconsin, to rezone the property at 7518 South Howell Avenue from B4 Highway Business to I-1 Institutional. Uh, am I ahead of you, Carrie? Nope, you're good. I'm all set. So the proposal is to rezone to I-1 in advance of a certified survey map to combine and reconfigure the property with the adjacent Sikh Temple property. Um, 
You'll recall that the comprehensive plan was amended in January of 2016 to plan, plan business based on a proposal for a multi-tenant commercial building on that property. Nothing was actually um, completed on that property in terms of construction. So the Sikh temple has acquired that property now um, and is requesting the rezone to be consistent with the surrounding zoning for the temple, which is currently I-1. And even though this is, um, the comprehensive plan was for planned business back in 2016, staff reminds you that we are currently under the process to amend the comprehensive plan. So uh, we're comfortable moving forward with this particular rezone request, recognizing that the comprehensive plan will be changed in the amendment process. So existing parcels in the immediate area are zoned for commercial manufacturing, institutional and park uses and staff believes that the I-1 Institutional District Purpose Statement is consistent uh, with the rezone request, or rather the rezone request is consistent with the Purpose Statement. And based on the proposal to consolidate the parcels, it's uh, something that, the, that staff feels is something that can move forward, again, without having to do a separate request to change the comprehensive plan back to something different. There is a suggested motion, should the plan commission feel that this is appropriate, that the plan commission recommends to the common council that the property at 7518 South Howell Avenue be rezoned from B4 Highway Business to I-1 Institutional after a public hearing. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. And before we start out, I just want to bring to everybody's attention, particularly the commissioners, uh, the map in your documents wrong. is wrong. That's, yes. that's the map for uh, the item on Shepard. So... Uh, Please disregard that, but what's on your monitor is correct, and, and for everybody out in the audience, once what you're looking at, I assume, is correct up there also. So Yes, what is shown on the screen is correct. Apologies for the error in the packet. Happens sometimes. Um, I don't see anybody wishing to speak on this subject. Would the applicants like to say a word, anything? Nothing? No? Okay, we'll open it up. Commissioners? Brian? Gone. Greg? I just have a quick question for the applicant. I was curious if there's plans for this property or if it's solely just rezoning it right now. Name and address, please. Since you compelled me, I will come up here and speak. <laughs> uh, my name is Peter Delay. I present the Sikh Temple of Wisconsin. Yeah, our future plan for that property is uh, half of it on the east side of it. We just like to create a parking and uh, half to the, uh, for the whole avenue on the west end. We just like to keep it as a nice landscape. Thank you. Is that it, Greg? That's it. Now, other than the, a comment, I mean, I, it seems appropriate considering that property is completely surrounded by the I-1 already. Chris? Fred? I don't see any problem. I don't see. No. No, and, and having been at the temple numerous times, they need parking. <laughs> you guys could use some extra parking sometimes. It's tough to find a spot there for your patrons. So uh, I do not have a problem with it either. Very good. Uh, with that, motion. Seifert moves that the Planning Commission recommends to the Common Council that the property at 7518 South Howell Avenue be rezoned from B4 Highway Business to I-1 Institutional after a public hearing. Mr. Kelsey, I'll second. Roll call. Anna, aye. Dustin, aye. Bill, aye. Lorik, aye. Kavich, aye. Mr. Kelsey, aye. Seifert, aye. Chandler, aye. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you for the planning committee also. You're welcome. Good night. Um, item 5C. Um, Review of a certified survey map by Henry Moss and Arlene Moss and Nancy Kean, uh, dividing the property at 1075 1 South Nicholson Avenue. The proposal is to divide one lot for a future residential um, a residential home on that property. Outlot 1 is also proposed to be converted to, as shown on the CSM, Lot 2, which would mean that it would be available for development purposes as well. Currently, it's, it's shown as an outlot from a previous CSM. 
existing easements are shown on the proposed CSM. There was one error that was identified in the property description that has been pre presented to the applicant. Um, it does need to be changed prior to recording of the CSM. There is a suggested motion that the Plan Commission recommends to the Common Council that the certified survey maps submitted by Harry Moss, Arlene Moss, and Nancy Kenyon for the property at 10751 South Nicholson Road be approved with the condition that all technical corrections, including but not limited to spelling errors, minor coordinate geometry corrections, and corrections required for compliance with the Municipal Code and Wisconsin statutes are made prior to recording. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, if the applicant would like to say a few words. If not, we'll take it right to the commission. Oh, seeing nobody, uh, we'll go right to commission. Chaucey? I had a question for the applicant dealing with the purpose for the change of outlet one to outlet. Oh, outlet you got to come up to the podium, sir. We make everybody do that. <laughs> <laughs> Name and address, please. Kurt Moss, 2132 West Oakwood Road. Can you provide us a little information on why the change from the outlet to one to outlot two? Uh, when I originally presented it uh, as outlot one, there were some statements that, that being an outlot it meant it was unbuildable, so we just had the surveyor change it to lot two. And a, uh, I've got an email into the surveyor to make the correction on the uh, description. Thank you. Fred, anything? Chris? Makes sense to me. Okay, Greg. Gone. Brian. Christine. Okay. Motion, please. Oracle moved that the Plan Commission recommend to the Common Council that the certified survey map submitted by Harry Moss, Arlene Moss, and Nancy Kenyon for the property at 10751 South Nicholson Road be approved with the condition that all technical corrections, including but not limited to spelling errors, minor coordinate geometry corrections, and corrections required for compliance with the municipal code and Wisconsin statutes are made prior to recording. Mr. Kowski, a second. Roll call. Anna, aye. Johnson, aye. Hello, aye. Clark, aye. David, aye. Mr. Kowski, aye. Sleeper, aye. Chandler, aye. Great, thank you. Good luck. Um, Item D is plan review. We're going to review site, building, landscape, lighting, and related plans submitted by Chris Nicholson, Zoomed America, LLC, for a light manufacturing headquarters facility on the property at 8142 South 6th Street. Gary. This may look a little familiar to plan commissioners, and that is because this was actually reviewed and approved in December of 2017, but there are some changes that have been made since then, so this is back before the plan commission for your review and approval. With that in mind, this is what the previous site plan had looked like. That dark blob in the middle is actually what the building footprint was. Parking is located on the north, and it was also located next to the warehouse facility. So if you recall, this was a one-and-a-half-story building, and there are some changes that will be presented um, in just a moment. This is what the presentation would be on the north. And you can see that there's a, cla a glass curtain wall that was proposed for the office portion. And then there was a main entrance in the center. The demonstration and um, testing room is on the right-hand side of the screen. And that was proposed to be a, an architectural metal panel. And then the warehouse was meant to uh, incorporate some concrete tip-up walls with some windows. And these were the proposed renderings that were presented back in December. And what is presented to the Plan Commission this evening is a slightly reconfigured footprint for the building. The black squares or rectangles that are in the center of the uh, lot now are representative of more of a T configuration. with the training rooms, offices, lobby, demo room, and break rooms on the north side of the building, as was previously shown in the uh, plans in December. However, that entire north side of the building is now two stories, and the entire building has been increased from about 49,500 square feet 
to about 57 and a half thousand square feet. Building setbacks appear to be met in the proposed plans. However, the parking setbacks are um, lacking at the moment. Um, staff has been in touch with the applicant's representative. We've been discussing that. And there are some options available for um, presenting these plans for future consideration, either to the Board of Zoning Appeals or uh, going forward with a text amendment, should it be um, improbable or impractical, impractical to relocate that parking in conformance with the required 20-foot setback to all right-of-way locations, which would be along Market Street and 6th Street. There's been one reduction. Um, there used to be 109 stalls in the plans that were approved. Uh, this plan shows 108 stalls. Again, the north lot would be available for public parking during non-business hours and weekends. As with the previous plans, there would be required parking stalls for office, warehouse, and repair at different um, gross square footage requirements. Um, the warehouse area is just over 17,000 gross square feet, which will require about four stalls plus one stall for every peak employee. The demonstration room and service department would be approximately 13,500 gross square feet, which would require 39 stalls plus one stall for every peak shift employee. And the remaining 26,000 and change gross square feet would be general office space, which would be a requirement for 106 stalls plus one for every peak shift employee. However, the plan commission should be aware that that gross square footage configuration or calculation is actually inclusive of restrooms, break rooms, hallways, lobbies, those kinds of areas. If you take those out of the equation, uh, that required number of parking stalls would be reduced significantly. And code does authorize the plan commission to make a modification to the minimum required parking stalls based on significant or based on criteria that would be included in the um, consideration that are in code. Um, there have been several conversations regarding the parking, what, what is required for the operation. There would only be 35 employees, as previously discussed. So based on that, based on the hours of operation, uh, staff is comfortable moving forward with the proposed stalls at 108. There's a trash and transformer enclosure with cedar panel gate in the loading dock area, which is located on the southeast. No elevations have been presented for those enclosures. However, um, within the submitted materials, it was noted that there would be they would utilize the same precast concrete panel as the building, and they would propose cedar infill pa uh, panel gates. But the as with the previous uh, plans, staff is recommending that the uh, that a more durable material be considered for the gate. No other outdoor storage is proposed at this time. The water and sewer utility has required, requested a, an easement for a portion of the public water and sewer on the private property that was presented to the applicant for their consideration in re revising the plans. Uh, the fire department also provided comments that they uh, must review and approve hydrant coverage and the location. Details are a little bit fuzzy on this particular uh, plan, but this is the landscape plan. Essentially, there is buffer for the parking lot on the north. There is landscaping around the building. A little bit difficult to see again. Uh, transform, or the mechanical units are located on the west side of the building, as with the previous plan. There is a vegetative screen wall that is proposed, as with the previous plan, for those mechanical units. No mechanical units are shown on the building um, or on the rooftop. If there are any, they would have to be screened as well. And you'll notice that this is the proposed building. Uh, the changes are quite significant. What you're looking at right now is the north, as would be seen from City Hall, actually looking south. Glass curtain wall, uh, aluminum framed glazing system with metal clad roof and glass doors on the north are the primary building materials. Uh, great precast concrete panels with windows on a portion of the northwest and warehouse are also proposed. There's a metal clad facade on the east portion of these two-story office 
uh, building. Dark metal panels are also proposed for the upper portion of the two-story building above the warehouse roof. And as you'll recall, metal panels are not listed as acceptable primary exterior building materials. materials. However, staff has had a conversation with the architect, and that percentage is forthcoming. If necessary, the plan commission can make um, a determination that um, the percentage, if it goes over 25%, is acceptable. And these are the renderings from the northwest and the south of the proposed changes to the building. If the plan commission is satisfied with the plans as presented with the conditions, there is a suggested motion that the plan commission approves the site and building plan submitted by Chris Nicholson of Zoomed America for the property at 8142 South 6th Street, subject to conditions one through six. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, with us tonight, we have a presentation from Zoom, so I will give you, the, I'll surrender the floor to you. Thank you. Um, Mayor and members of the Plan Commission, city staff and members of the community, we are happy to be back. My name is Tom Stacey. I'm with Epstein Union Architects. I'm managing our, our efforts. We are teamed with a number of uh, great design partners, Fabian Graf of Graf and Tolosa, based in San Francisco, family friend of the Zund family, and primary designer of the building. We are the architect of record, so our job is to create the construction documents, see it through the process, of course, and, um, and follow it through construction. Hunzinger Construction is, is the selected builder, so they're at the ready and anxious to get started. To my left, Kevin Byrne, representing Kapoor & Associates. Kapoor has designed both the, the civil uh, engineering component and landscape. So Kevin's here and available for any questions. Uh, in the audience, Chris and um, Keith from Zoomed are also available uh, for any questions. And certainly one of the questions on your mind is, why did we change a design that was approved? And, and we, we scratched our heads a little um, <laughs> as well. Um, you know, the Swiss are great at making time, timekeeping devices and very, very key on precision. And, but they take their time, and, and they deserve the, you know, the benefit of reconsidering some things that they had previously initiated and that's what this was all about. It was looking further into the future. Uh, so Oliver and his father, Carl, met um, after uh, the Thanksgiving holiday and, and through the winter and deliberated back and forth on what the building should be. And lo and behold, uh, Carl, uh, the, the founder of the company, made some changes um, for the long-term long -term benefit of the company. So what, what you see before you tonight is, is a fairly significant change in the appearance of the building. The function is still the same. Uh, there is more uh, square footage in the building, two stories uh, towards the north section, uh, which we feel is a, a, a beautiful backdrop to this building. It will, will always uh, look great in the, in the foreground. Um, the warehouse component is a very simplified, streamlined um, component it's 25 feet tall it's board form concrete precast concrete which I did bring a supplement tonight because we, it was really difficult to bring in a two by two sample of concrete um, I will tell you that it's a it's a textural material we don't get the opportunity to use this material very often but I think you'd be very pleased you you would I guess maybe see some examples at a colectivo or or some buildings like that. It has kind of an artisan quality to it. So d despite where, what it may render like in the image uh, as very austere and, and purposeful, we feel it's very sculptural and, and elegant and, and simple. And it contrasts beautifully, we, f we feel, with the office, which is this, this really wonderful glass um, uh, element that overlooks City Hall. So I, I can certainly, I've got a flash drive for staff that they can upload, but I brought some printing copies that will give you a little, better, a little better indication of what the material choices are. Um, aside from that, uh, the site plan, I think uh, Carrie and I spoke yesterday, and I think we're working on a, a path forward as, as it relates to the setbacks, but I would just say that those are unchanged from last time. What we did sacrifice in this repositioning of the building was one parking stall. 
uh, the access easement that was arranged uh, very arduously and uh, over a span of time with Woodman's is the same, uh, has been uh, unchanged. So the location of the truck docks, all those elements that tie back to that um, agreement are unchanged. So if I can take a minute and just hand these out. Perhaps while, while Tom is doing that, I'd, I'd just like to kind of weigh in and uh, thank uh, the company and the uh, architectural team for taking another look at this. I mean, we, we, what, the building that was approved, yeah. that's fine, uh, was, was a good looking building. I think what was being presented tonight is a great looking building. So happy to have that as our neighbor, as our backdrop. I think in terms of, of quality and in terms of visual impact, it'll be a, a welcome neighbor the whole uh, Drexel Town Square architectural palette. Thank you, Doug. Um, on that first sheet after the cover, you'll see illustrations of, of both a darker concrete finish, which is a honed finish. That would be the, the element that faces 6th Street uh, towards the west. It's an illustration of the metal cladding we're contemplating. That's a darker uh, zinc-like material. We actually use the same material on our rooftop expansion in the third ward. So this is a material that is, to call it metal panel is, is almost uh, a misnomer. It's a, it's a composite material and, and we use it on class A office buildings. Uh, anodized aluminum window framing. And then the last picture is a board form concrete, which we're really excited about. Uh, next page, some, just some images of smooth concrete uh, very Europe, European flavor is feel is appropriate to the to the building. Next sheet, a couple images of a, a building in Michigan, constructed of board form concrete, uh, almost exclusively, quite frankly. And and we're being very careful to um, create variety in the patterning so it doesn't look like a stamped panel. Uh, down to the concrete admixtures which will create more uniformity so that you don't have a, a, a real visible difference between one panel to the next. Are those poured walls? Or are they it's a precast pre product, but it's, okay. it's uh, bed cast. So as, a, as opposed to extruded precast, which we mm -hmm. see plenty of, this is, this is cast in a form and, and then delivered to the site. Okay, thank you. It's an insulated panel. Um, a couple other images of just acid etched concrete, which it's a little bit lighter in this image, but that is the, the material that's on the west facade. Uh, continuing on, a uh, couple images of the metal panel. Um, and I, I know there was a question about the percentage of metal panel that's visible. Uh, this is actually to the benefit of our friends at Woodman's primarily because this faces east. So um, it will certainly be visible in perspective from certain vantage points, um, but it is um, um, it, it roughly constitutes maybe 20, 25 percent of the total facade material. But again, we feel it's a very elegant um, and beautiful material. And I just included a couple updates on on renderings and and things just to round out. We are still examining additional fenestration, additional windows on the. East facade facing Woodman's because there have been some modest plan tweaks since the submittal, but it's nothing significant and I think only enhances the appearance of that particular facade. And then the last page is just a, a view from, from the southeast corner. Oh, um, one thing I did want to point out is, is we did, uh, Fabian did include some notes on the trash enclosure, and we have moved away from a cedar-clad metal gate, metal frame gate, to a fully um, metal gate that matches the colors of the building. And the walls are precast for durability. That's it. I think certainly open to any questions, Chris, and 
and Keith are here uh, to answer any questions you may have of them. Kevin, of course, for landscape and civil. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we'll open it up for questions. Christina, you want to start? Yes, I do actually have a question for the applicant. How does board form concrete is maintained throughout the year? How does it lose its loss? Does it lose? How is, how is it going to be maintained? It actually, um, I think it ages quite well. I think there's a um, pretty good example in Bayview at the Colectivo. I think they did some board form there. It's been up for a number of years. You know, th th this building will be very well looked after, I, I can assure you. The, the Zun family in Switzerland, uh, their buildings are impeccably managed. So occasionally you, you power wash the exterior if necessary. Uh, but I think it, it sort of patinas with with age a little bit, but not anything remarkably different. I guess where I'm coming from, because of course it's not a smooth texture, so it's going to be grasping all of the dirt and the pollution from the air, and over the years it's going to change its color. So I would be kind of concerned with the appearance and the neighborhood too. So. Sure, it's a fair question. We would we're planning on sealing the the material. Okay. Uh, just a a matte finish sealer to try to keep that from adhering. Exactly, but no we, holes or anything that will have like anything like that. So overall maintenance, not just the outside. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I'm saying like because this texture tend to have natural like holes or opening areas to just to give the natural look of the concrete. However, sometimes this will be like a, almost like an invitation for your neighborhood, uh, a neighbor's nature coming in into that area. So... My only concern would be maintenance throughout the years and the appearance of the building overall after how many years. Understood. And I think it, if, if there was a situation where um, it would be advantageous to put on a semi-transparent stain or exterior coating in the future, I think that would be a, a really good resolution if in, indeed uh, it didn't age well. But I, I can tell you that the... The building that's illustrated in the packet, it's unfortunately in Michigan, it sounds like a road trip, but um, that building's been up for probably five or six years. So that indicates kind of the character of that. And actually, that's why I asked this question, because you could see a little bit of water stain a little bit in the concrete, and it's not a pretty sight, but it's something to think of when you are going through that process. Yeah, and honestly, I don't know if they sealed the exterior yeah, or what they know. did to uh, prepare that. So our intention is to seal the exterior to keep that from happening. Okay. Brian? Just staying on that theme, the pavilion out of Lake Vista has board form concrete on it. Oh, we have thank, thank you for that point. Familiar parity with that in this, in this room, at least. Um, Carrie, as far as utility easements, do we need to make that a condition for our approval here? You can if you wish to make it a specific condition. However, we do have a requirement for updated plans to be submitted, so that would incorporate those comments made at the in, within the staff report. But if you wish to make a separate uh, condition, we certainly can. If they're covered, can. we don't need to. That was all. On. Oh, no real comments other than uh, it looks very nice. It would be a nice addition to this room, I'm sure. Greg? Um, first, I love the building. It looks great. I appreciate the, the windows facing City Hall because I think that's the best aspect of the building. Um, is there any, any pavers planned in the parking lot to kind of mirror the streets around here in Yes, actually, and, and Kevin, I don't know if you want to just interject. We are planning porous pavement in the parking fields. That was part of the agreement, I believe. It was. Um, I know you don't show them, but when you came through here the last time, too, I think we made it pretty clear. Yeah, we are actually, Kevin Byrne with Kapoor and Associates, uh, Civil and Landscape for the project. We are actually showing the bay of parking adjacent to the building uh, as all permeable um, to kind of provide that transition from a normal asphalt to that building and, and create some of that aesthetic and pull that away from the building as well. We appreciate that. And again, you know, everything in town square has been eco-friendly as much as possible. So everybody has uh, abided by that and we appreciate that. 
Thank you. Chris? Um, you know, this really is just a great, a great looking building. You know, we thought the last one was pretty neat and different than uh, what this really is unique. Um, you mentioned uh, you know, very European. I just came back from Europe, so I, I can see a, a slice in, uh, of Europe in it. Um, I trust that Zoom will definitely keep their word and, and manage uh, the building. And they seem to be a, a company, especially with family owned that they're, they're going to have a lot of pride uh, in their premises. Um, we talked about the um, pavers, um, shared parking that still that's in, uh, still works in there for the city yes. hall. Okay. Um, that was it. Brad? Yeah, I have a question about the thickness of this concrete. The walls, how thick are they? Well, with insulation, because it, it's a sandwich panel. I, I realize it's I think it's about uh, 12 to 15 inches thick. We haven't finalized that completely, but it's it's a load-bearing concrete, a precast concrete wall. So typically with insulation, it's one foot three. I also agree it's a nice looking building. Thank you. I have a question. Let's start with Carrie. So can you provide a little more information on the parking setbacks that are not compliant? Did we approve that last time? The parking setback requirement is 25 feet to rights of way. In the previous set of plans that were reviewed and approved in December. There was a mention in the staff report that the, the zoning district actually had to go through an amendment because it was 30 feet and we reduced it to 25 feet. Within that staff report, we said that the parking would be compliant with that. Whether or not it was an oversight or a misunderstanding of what the actual um, dimensions were on that site plan, it was understood, at least from staff's perspective, that parking would be compliant. When we saw these plans, we saw that the dimensional requirements were not met. So that's what flagged it. That's why it's mentioned here. That's why there's a process moving forward to address it. And if, if I may, and perhaps to supplement that answer, I think that uh, certainly our, our base zoning is for our industrial districts, whether it's the M1 or the light manufacturing, the LM1, are designed for a slightly different settings than what you see at Drexel Town Square. And this property, while it's adjacent to Drexel Town Square, it's not part of the, the operating plan or the general development plan for Drexel Town Square. Thus, you know, we've got more suburban type setbacks into what we consider more of an urban environment. And certainly uh, the setbacks for the city hall parking lot across the street, all the parking lots in Drexel Town Square are not anywhere close to that, and this more closely mirrors the kind of the street, the streetscape, the street edge that you have with all the other developments in, in Drexel Town Square. So it's it's really how do we get from A to B? It's not whether we get from A to B. I think that there's a realization that that this is the right thing to do. It just we need to get there. So where are we today? What's the number? <laughs> You're talking about what the setback is. Mm -hmm. What? what? I think it's right about 15 feet, somewhere around there. We are 12 feet off of Market Street, which is the utility easement. And then I believe we are, one moment here. We are 10 and a half feet off of 6th Street. Off the right of way. How do we, your point that we get to a better place? That's pretty. <laughs> the, the most pretty direct route would be a variance request. There's, there's, there are three options that were mm -hmm. mentioned, and one of them would be revise the plan, which we all probably recognize is not something that is practical. Two would be to request a variance to the Board of Zoning Appeals, or three would be to request a text amendment to reduce that parking setback either, even further within the LM1 district. So those are, the, those are the three options. Two of them are options that are probably most practical. Um, and in fact, potentially the text amendment might be the way that we go. Thank you. 
And then I have a question for the applicant, and I may have missed this earlier. When you were providing feedback on why the change. I, I guess I didn't quite catch the purpose for the change because I have more square footage in adding a warehouse. Is that what's going on? What? The warehouse is always part of okay. the project. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really, and just to maybe expound on what happens within the facility, um, uh, assembled materials, assembled equipment is received from Switzerland, arrives here at this building to be um, shipped and, and packaged or assembled for display. Um, so there's no manufacturing that, that's uh, still consistent with what was previously um, described. There is a, a large um, display and demo area for customers to come in and see the ver the various sizes of equipment that are offered. Think of it as a showroom, really, a, a working showroom. Uh, that's a large component. And upstairs are support offices, downstairs, uh, along with the demo area, training, um, conference rooms, other offices. So to a large extent, especially in the northern portion of the building that faces City Hall, it's office or display. And then the the, the section that, that runs parallel to 6th Street is storage of equipment that's either be in, receive, in receiving from uh, Switzerland or on its way to a customer in the States. So the addition of the second floor is for offices and a display? It was to better enable the company to grow in the future if they needed to. I think there was uh, some consideration by... Um, leadership in Switzerland that this particular design would allow them to grow even more if, if they, they had the need. As opposed to the previous design, it was pretty much, um, not that you couldn't expand it, but I think it would have been more difficult, its configuration. So that's really what drove that, that change. And then the aesthetics sort of followed, quite frankly. It wasn't that, that folks didn't like the original design, that just the, the senior leadership in Switzerland thought there might be a better path forward, so that's what happened. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else before I pipe in? Fred? One question about the flat roof. How do you maintain that flat roof? Control the runoff and so forth? Well, it's it's pitched to drain. It's, it's, pitch. it's a ballasted roof, which was a... Um, we, we deal with all varieties of flat roof um, systems in our in our world today. Uh, most industrial buildings are flat roof. Most office buildings are flat roof. It's a it's a, a 60 mil EPDM membrane with uh, rock ballast. Uh, there's no rooftop equipment on the roof. Everything is internal, and that's a, that's a good thing for the longevity of the the mechanical systems in the building. So no rooftop equipment. So everything's pitched to drain, and it, it works through internal conductors and ties to the storm system. But as far as maintenance, it's pretty pretty low maintenance, quite honestly, because there's not this huge canopy of trees in close proximity. That's usually a, a big problem spot for some roofs. Most roofs is predominance of trees, but um, it's a 20, 25-year roof lifespan. So very, actually very low maintenance. That's incredible. I was just going to also add, I do like the addition of um, a balcony. I don't recall it being on the last plan. So that would be awesome. Great for point. Employees. Yeah, that, that was a shift. That is employee and customer centric space. And mm -hmm. uh, they, they felt the, the view to the west and certainly to the north was more favorable than looking at at Woodman's. Yeah. <laughs> no offense to Woodman's, but you know, the view's better to the west, and uh, especially off the second level, it, it's an elevated view, and I think very favorably. Now, you know, we did propose painting the Swiss Alps on that side of Woodman's, but that didn't, <laughs> didn't get approved. And everybody? All right, um, give you my two cents. Totally worth the wait. Uh, this is a world-class building going on here. I have the privilege of going to uh, a, basically a building award show every year called Top Projects. 
it awards the nicest looking architectural, well-built, remodeled buildings in the state. Not just the area, the state. You happen to be sitting in one of them that won an award. This building won an award for top projects. Uh, last year, the Aurora remodel got it. And I believe we got another one here. So this is really something uh, unique. The only thing that would have probably really just made my day was if you had solar or green roof on there, going back to the roofs. <laughs> but but um, again, it, it the use of the panel, the glazing, the colored concrete, um, just the contrast that's given in, in the barn boards, uh, it's going to be an amazing project. Uh, kudos to the architect that did the landscape. I know, you know we talked a little bit about the setbacks, but it maintains that parkway that starts to form as you go down 6th Street and makes that transition. And uh, Director Seymour made this point, although that technically isn't in DTS, for all practical purposes, it's part of DTS, but it's, it's zoned a little differently. So I wouldn't classify this building as an M1 or an L1, which is where we're dealing with the parking. I'd look at it more as an urban setting here. I'd look at it as an office building. Um, man, it, this thing's really cool. I, I, I'm really at a loss. It's, it's really impressive, guys. It's going to be a great addition coming in here. Uh, this is something you don't see every day. Uh, kudos to to Zoomed, and uh, this is an example of really taking the time and doing it right rather than doing it fast and coming back. As you said, you could have added on to the other building, which was unique in its own right, but it would have started to look probably like you, you were piecing things together here. Uh, not the case here. You added, th what, about 13,000 square foot overall, somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah, a little less than that. We went less. from 49 and some change to 57. Yeah, for the sacrifice of one parking spot, I'm pretty good with that. So um, looks great. Uh, again, I can't say much more than what's been said. I really do like the way 6th Street's been maintained, uh, the look from all levels. I mean, even, even when you're looking from Woodman's, you're coming out of a different area although that's not part of DTS, it, it's a different feel, and it, it, it really starts to blend that way as to what the look is at Woodman's, and just as the glass starts to blend to what goes on a little bit north here. So um, looks great. If, if there's no other discussion, I'm ready for a motion on this one. Clark moves that the plan commission approve the site and building plans submitted by Chris Nicholson, Zoomed America, LLC, for the property at 8142 South 6th Street with the following conditions. Number one, that all relevant code requirements remain in effect. Number two, that the plans are revised to meet the required minimum parking setbacks or that a variance request is submitted to the Board of Zoning Appeals prior to the issuance of building permits. No building permits shall be issued unless and until the setback issue is resolved. Number if I can jump in here and just revise that even further. Um, or that a zoning text amendment is requested. So there are three options. Okay. Thank you. Um, number th three, that the plans are revised to include details for the proposed dumpster and generator enclosure, and that a more durable material such as composite is used for the gate. Number four, that the plans are revised to include locations for all mechanicals, transformers, and utilities if added. All mechanical equipment, transformers, and utility boxes, ground, building, and rooftop shall be screened from view. Number five, that final lighting plans consistent with the standards for Drexel Town Square businesses, indicating luminaire type, pole type, color, and height are submitted for final approval by the Director of Community Development upon written recommendation of the electrical inspector prior to submission of building permit applications. And number six, that all revised plans, site building, landscaping, etc., are submitted in digital format for review and approval by the Department of Community Development prior to the submission of building permit applications. Three for seconds. Roll call. Anna, aye. Johnston, aye. Rilla, aye. Lorik, aye. David, aye. Kuzikowski, aye. Seaford, aye. Chandler, aye. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Good job. We're as excited as you are. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's going to be really great. When you get to move dirt this fall excellent yep um 
Item 5E is review of a certified survey map submitted by the City of Oak Creek dividing the properties at 125 South Shepherd Avenue. And who's got that one? Carrie. It's actually 10.025. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say that wrong? I said 125. 10,025. Sorry about that. 10025. There we go. For those keeping score. <laughs> Too many zeros. So the proposal is to divide four single family residential lots on the property located in red on your screen. That is actually in the northeast corner of the property. All four lots are proposed to be the exact same uh, square footage. They are conforming lots that would be for future sale and residential development. And plan commissioners should be aware of a few items. Uh, the floodway and flood fringe designations delineated around the stormwater pond are, sh are not anywhere near the proposed lots. Uh, there's none of those designations on these lots, as you can see from the CSM. The limited development area and resource protection area land use categories in the comprehensive plan are in the vicinity of the existing stormwater pond, but again, not in the vicinity of the existing lot or the proposed lots. This parcel has not been identified in Milwaukee County's plan recommendations for natural areas or critical habitat. Parcel is also not included as environmentally sensitive lands in the city's park and open space plan. And the Common Council reviewed and approved the amended boundaries of the Nature Center affecting this property to allow for the creation and sale of the proposed lots at their meeting on August 6th of this year. There are no other changes proposed. The bulk of the remaining land would remain for stormwater and nature center purposes. There is a drainage easement proposed on the north 25 feet of lot 1 and 40 feet of width for public road right-of-way dedication is included along Shepherd Avenue for all four of the proposed lots. There was one item that was identified, and that is that the entire parcel of which these four lots are being carved from is not included, and also that the signature page is missing the acceptance and dedication of the public right-of-way that is proposed. With those things in mind, if the Plan Commission is satisfied with the proposed CSM, there is a suggested motion that the Plan Commission recommends to the Common Council that the certified survey map submitted by the City of Oak Creek for the property at 10,025 South Shepherd Avenue be approved subject to conditions 1 through 3. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, we do have one person wishing to speak on this uh, before we go to commission, and that is Carol Burns, 510 East Robert Road. Come on up, Carol. Hi. So before I start, everybody go like this because name, you've name been sitting for a while. I'm still Carol Burns, and I'm yeah. still at 510 East Robert Road. Nice to meet you all. Um, I do have some show and tell items here. You are all awake. Yeah, we don't. I know. Okay. Unless we're super So packed. I just want to let you know before I begin that I'm recording this on Facebook Live because there are a number of my neighbors who couldn't be here tonight who were concerned. Um, in 2003, we sat in a similar position as we do right now, uh, right then with uh, Mayor Dale Richards. His administration had proposed 12 homes and a road be built in the same location as the new construction Mayor Richard listened and understood, having visited many of our homes that flooded in 2001. Um, he saw firsthand the devastation of that flooding and the destruction that caused um, due to poor city planning. So after listening to the group, he, he and his administration agreed to protect the current residents. We were told no building would be conducted on that site. It would remain a prairie as a way to keep the area from ever having, and all the neighbors ever having to worry about flooding waters again. So what happened? Why are we here? Um, before I continue, can I see a show of hands how many people are from our neighborhood and are really concerned about this? Okay, so um, when I asked our alderman, Ken Gale, about this, he told me it was a done deal. Don't worry about coming. This was just a formality to let us talk and get our words in. Um, didn't make me really happy. That the high school had purchased the land and the board knew about the history of flooding and hopefully it wouldn't happen again. Hopefully, truly. Um, sorry. Uh, I'm sure that the other families here will let you know about their fears, but let me tell you about general comments about this flooding. The area between Shepherd and Darlene used to be a swamp. 
when we first moved into our home, we could watch children float rafts in the, in, in the spring flooding, and we could hear thousands of spring peepers going off. It was so loud that even with our windows shut, we could hear those spring peepers. Then they decided to build the two homes on Darlene Lane, and they decided to start developing it, and we could no longer hear the spring peepers. Okay, So uh, in the years that followed up to 2001, we did have flooding in the streets. It would come up over our sidewalk. Then in 2001, the waters hit hard, and the system couldn't keep up. We were told by city engineers, I see there's one here, um, that the drainage wasn't sufficient for our home. They were also t we were also told, my husband and I at our, that time, that our house was the first one built in the area. And when the city engineer realized that they had built it too low, they built everybody else higher, making our home the retention pond for that subdivision. And let me tell you, it was. We had four feet of water after that flood. It didn't come in from the sewers. In fact, the sewers were bubbling up. It came in around our foundation. It came in through the windows, and that's the pictures I'm showing you. We had four feet. That's just our house. That wasn't my neighbors. There, everybody here was affected by that flooding in some way, shape, or form. Our house sustained $35,000 in damage. We had more than that in loss. I lost my wedding dress, my wedding photos, our kids' memories, their toys, um, my business. I ran a child care. It was in the basement. It was. Um, it devastated my family, and not just mine, but my neighbors as well. I've shared with you some of the pictures of the flood. The streets on Darlene, Robert, and a portion of Fitzsimmons were lined with items of things that people lost in that flood. Um, I can't even start to imagine the cost of all of those people and all of their stuff. I can only tell you mine. I also want to tell you about the emotional toll this took. Every time the skies get dark, every time that weatherman says, oh, there's potential for flooding, I can barely sleep. I come home from work early because I want to make sure that my house isn't going to flood. So after they put the retention pond in, we were told, we're good. This won't happen again. It did the next year. Okay, we didn't have four feet that time. We were lucky we only had like two. But it's still flooded. And it continues to flood. It doesn't flood as far up to our road because then they went and they kind of made the drains a little bit bigger. Um, but it still floods. My backyard, I finally took a third of my backyard and made it a prairie so that it could contain some of the water. I had a city engineer come out to our house. You know what they told me? Build a moat. Dig ditches alongside all around your house so that the water can go in there. Okay, I want to tell you that one other reason I'm recording this is if this goes through and because of those houses, our house floods again and my neighbor's houses flood, I want you guys to buy my house for fair market value because I will never be able to sell it. You've kind of condemned me already. Um, so I'm told that the buildings of these homes is going to be for the high school construction company. And I applaud the high school construction company. I think it's a great opportunity for these kids. But if I were the high school and I knew that their homes were putting ours in danger, and not only that, but they're basically building on a floodplain, what kind of, you're in building, what kind of a reputation is that going to build for this construction company if when these houses go in, they flood? or they flood us. That's not going to be really good either. So I'm hoping that maybe you guys can reconsider this. If I need a petition, I'll get the paperwork and I'll get you a petition. Um, I'm, I'm asking you to do the right thing, to please reverse the sale of this, to mark that whole area as floodplain. I, I honestly, I'm not against the buildings and I'm not against the high school. I'm against my house being flooded. I'm against their houses being flooded. You know, when you put those houses in, it's not just a house. You're also putting in a yard, and you're putting in concrete, and all of that doesn't absorb the water. So please, consider that. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, before we put it out to council, um, let's just be clear, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, we don't declare floodways, the DNR declares floodways, correct? So we don't put determination on where floodway is. 
Also, the school makes a determination on building. It's, it's somewhat buyer beware for the school. They actually purchased another lot elsewhere in the city. And when they did the soil samples, it just didn't work out to be a buildable lot, so they passed on it. Uh, ma'am, ma'am, just I got the floor for a minute here. So, again, there, there's some due diligence here. Those roads that are shown, we don't intend to get rid of the, the, the whole prairie, what have you. Uh, the detention pond has been um, designed, in a sense, to take care of that area for the drainage to, to go to it from Shepherd. Um, these four homes, that pond's also big enough, if they ever get the four homes, to hold that amount, so I've been told. Um, but there are officially mapped roads still in there. So believe it or not, somebody could come in here and say, I want to put the roads in and build the other nine homes, and we'd have to sit here as a, a planning commission and a council and consider those things. Those are still officially mapped. I, I can't, I, I don't know enough about uh, environmental engineering to know if, if, if why, why the things flooded so far on Robert from Shepherd, I, I, I just don't have explanation of that, why it happened those couple of times back when we had the heavy flooding on the east side of the city. Um, I know Oakwood Road sustained quite a bit. And some of the low spots there over on uh, Forest Hill, too, got hit pretty hard. Um, usually when we, we do something, when we do development, we try our best to improve the drainage going forward. Um, but again, I'm not an expert on that, so I'm not going to weigh my opinions out. But um, Again, the schools offered to extend those homes. It would be one at a time. They'd, they'd buy it and CSM them off. Uh, but again, it would be up to them to determine if the lots are, are buildable. Uh, they would be hooked up to city sewer and water, so uh, they would have to meet all drainage codes and what have you going forward. So um, I'll open it up to the commission. And I had my two cents. I'll start with Christine. She looks ready to go. Okay. Uh, my first question for the applicant. How did you determine that those lots or those four lots are going to increase or make your situation worse? Based on what facts? Uh, wait a minute. That, that, city is the, the applicant. App we're, the city is the applicant. Well, then the, 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 the homeowner neighborhood, that spoke? The neighborhood. Yes, based on what? Um. Ma'am, you, you have to be, I, you know, Doug. Perhaps the better question would be, for Brian, if you could maybe characterize what, uh, how the lots are engineered and, and what the potential impact is on based on the grading for that, because it was really designed to be minimal. Exactly. Um, these lots are on the top of the hill. Um, they do drain towards the pond. Um, the pond is sized to handle the drainage coming from these four lots there. Um, not uh, a wetland, or not a, excuse me, not a floodplain area up on top of the hill. The floodplain is around the, the pond only, not up on top of the hill. And I don't know off the top of my head what the grade difference is between the pond and the okay. hill there, or what the, the lots are on Robert and Darlene. I believe that yeah, um, these lots are higher than what Robert and Darlene are. So. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, oh, hang on, ma'am. I think you could phrase my question. How is this lot coming from, like, uh, uh, infiltrated, like, forest? So it's just going to be draining. You're saying towards that. How did you study for your engineering? How is this going to impact the floodplain area that says here it is within the floodplain? What is the, the impact of that construction on that uh, the, neighborhood? The whole lot does contain floodplain because the pond is contained yeah. on that lot. So that's this why... Is, there is floodplain on there. These four lots that they are trying to create are not part of the floodplain. Okay, so that's that. How about yeah. how about these? How is this going to impact the neighborhood drainage wise? Very minimally to the pond. How and did you determine that? For typical homes draining off through, you're going to have infiltration through the, the ground as that water runs off. It's not a storm sewer pipe. It's a ditch that runs down to the pond. But how many years of a storm sewer to a uh, storm uh, water. How many years can you do your drainage design? That's looking at a, a 210 and a 100 year storm. 
But you didn't, did you have like soil samples to see how the soil affect the rest of the neighborhood or the runoff, uh, how many inlets are needed? Or is this like any like design done to make sure that this is not going to be impacted? As far as the stormwater, yes, that was all looked at to drain off, run through the ditch. Um, they didn't take soil samples, uh, typical infiltration throughout the city, but that was looked at and accommodated for there. I just want to point out two things. One thing, you're absolutely right. We're not in a floodplain, but we flood all the time. And because we're not in a floodplain, we can't get flood insurance. So we're kind of screwed there. Um, and also, yeah, the houses, they're way higher than the ones on Robert and Darlene. And uh, you can try and direct the water to go towards that pond, but it, the way that that hill is, it's going to come right back at us. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, when you're talking about the drainage and, and you know, the things are going to go into the pond, have you looked at that retention pond lately? Yes. Yeah, you see how high it is? Yeah, uh, it's not big enough, so you could make it bigger. And the other thing is, is that the sewers that are within Robert and that Shepherd Hills area and Darlene, there's not enough of them. So they're not pulling them on. The other part of that is, though, as I mentioned, the water was coming up from the sewers like bubblers. So even if there was enough sewers, it's not enough of a basin to take that water away. Instead of the water going away, it's coming up and into my house. And I'm not lying to you. I've got video. You know, every time the lightning flashed, it got closer to my house until we were surrounded. Can I say something? I guess for you. We are just, I guess, at least at, from my perspective here, I'm just here to see what the impact of those lots on your, on the homes, to answer you. These, from what I understood, anybody correct me if I'm wrong, building these and with the new system that they have in place, from what I heard from the engineer next to me or from Brian here, your flood may flood again, but it's not because of these houses. It may flood because of the location of the variation of the elevation. How yeah. your house is compared to the rest of the neighborhood. Right, know. and that's why I'm trying to avoid you taking up more of the land space so that it can soak in the water so that it doesn't come into my basement. You know, it's kind of like saying, oh, well, you bought the wrong house. I guess from what I'm hearing is they are doing extra steps from those buildings to add extra drainage to take it away. But it's not going away. It's going to come towards us. If you look at, I don't know if you've been down there, but if you look, they are higher than Darlene Lane. If you look on the map that's on the screen, uh, it'll show the location of those four lots. It's a flat map. Transport, it is. It's, it's transposed. Uh, it's, it doesn't have the pond on there, but it's, the pond is in the southernmost portion that is adjacent to Quail Run. Uh, again, Brian, our stormwater management personnel, this is not in a floodplain, and I understand and truly do respect uh, your feelings with respect to potential impacts, but I, I think that our engineers are taking that into account and making this the least impactful on that storage area, which was designed to accommodate that. Is that correct? That is correct. The, the pond was originally designed to accommodate these lots. Um, if, if you want to say something, you have to come up to the podium, please. Stark. Oh, my name is on, on the mic I'm sorry. My name is Mary Ann Stark. I live at 495 East Darlene Lane. As you can tell, I'm nervous because I don't do this. But I live by the prairie. It's behind my house. We were told nothing would ever be on built. On the microphone, there. please. Nothing would ever be built there. I live there, and I got to tell you, I'm really sad. All you want to do is build, build, build. We've got this prairie. We're finally getting butterflies. We're finally getting bumblebees. Don't you want your children to have that? I don't understand. All this building, leave that alone. If anything, get it to be a, whatever the environmental thing is to make it, just leave it there and be a prairie. 
Do you, has anybody ever walked there? I have. I'm always walking there. And I got to tell you, those buildings you want to put in, that's going to take some of the prairie. Now, I have seen this developing all these years, and this is so neat. You see finches, and you see the bumblebees. We haven't had bumblebees in how long? I think the butterflies. Why do we have to build homes? I understand I'm with Carol, with the flooding, and also with the uh, uh, children to have learn. I mean, that's cool. I mean, hey, I wish they had that when I was a teenager to learn how to build things. But I'm just wishing that Oak Creek would say, you know what, let's leave this piece of land alone. We've had problems with the flooding. It's a prairie. Let's have something natural. All we're doing is building and building. And that's why I'm sad. When I got this thing, I thought, really? You're going to do this to us? Your children could walk around and see butterflies and bumblebees. I walk around it all the time, and I enjoy it. And then I go and I see these markers, and you're building these homes. You want to build more homes? Everywhere you look, you got quail run. You got the other one. You got this one. You got to put four more homes when you have a beautiful, natural piece there for your children to walk around. I love when I see the kids fishing in the, in the pond because they're being natural kids. They're not being these kids on the computers all the time and that. I'm sorry, this is the way I feel, and I wish Oak Creek would say, let's make this a nature center and have nobody touch it. That's the way I feel, and I hope we can do that. Thank you. My name is Mike Gramza. I live at 9970 South Shepherd. And when they put in that tension pond, they sent out to each and every one of us maps of that they were going to put a park in there. What happened to the park? Then they say they're going to put a prairie in. And some of it does have prairie grass in it. The majority of it could be cut down and be nice. Okay. Um, I'll give you the historical perspective of what I know. Um, whether they sent it out and said it was going to be a park could have been a funding issue uh, that they never had the funds for it. Could have been a type of park that was going to be all natural, which is what it remains. Well, they I had it all set up with roads and everything. Going well, again, it. there's officially mapped roads, but for the meantime, it goes back to 2003 with former Mayor Dale Richards, and for whatever reason with the builder, something didn't work there. The entrance from Shepherd. I, I'm, I'm not, not knowledgeable enough to speculate why it didn't happen, but that got left wide open. So the retention pond went in, to help serve flooding issues, um, and they decided to put prairie grass in there. And in some respects, maybe it took. In some respects, maybe it didn't. Um, when when what we did a few years back, um, and really. We looked at available land that Oak Creek had, not specifically for the school, but surplus land that we had that could be productive for all citizens. And by productive, I mean we could put residents in or businesses in that we could sell off surplus land because all we do is maintain it. And we receive no tax base from it. And I don't want to sound like it's all about money, but this was a very good partnership with the schools, and these four lots came up as buildable. We just recently sold off a, a small sliver after we redid some roads over in Willow Heights uh, to one of the neighbors there that was adjacent to it. We have no intentions of pulling the prairie out of there. And at this time, I know of nobody that wants to build and put those the rest of those homes in and connect up to Darlene or wherever that map leads. Well, there's 13 acres that are available right behind us. 13 acres there's right behind us. There's 13 acres that's for sale. And, and that's up to the school board to look at. We were only looking at land we controlled. you got to remember that. As a city, we are looking at different surpluses of land, and we have some odd lots, some out lots that we maintain, and we look if we need them for future right away or um, you know, if there's ever a road going in, we don't want to run into that, we'll hang on to it. But if, if we could move those parcels out, that's what we are trying to do. So uh, these four lots came up as as um, candidates for for the school. So that, that's how it really started to develop. And then how come we weren't told 
I called up a number of times. Nobody knew what was going on until tonight. As far as, as the lots uh, being what up? What was going on and everything. They were out there measuring and everything, and I talked to a bunch of people. And they, we don't know nothing. You have to call the city. Well, the school had to go out and, that wasn't and, the and do the well, the school had to hire a, a engineering company. They're yeah. not going to go out and no. do uh, an official survey on it. They had a survey. All I was told is go to the city. Go it was the city. City hired the survey. City? I thought I thought the school pays for that. Do the sale price. They. It's, that was, oh, but uh, the city yeah. provides a service. I didn't know that. Okay. Regardless, there's a it was a surveyor that was out there doing yeah. doing the work on Either behalf way. of. I'm Jamie McMahon. I'm at 505 East Robert Road. I just have a couple questions too. Um, so first of all, it is considered a designated nature area. Is that correct? It, right now, it is just considered city property that we have a prairie on. Okay. Uh, we have no binding legal Damn. thing with the DNR or anybody like that, that it's a prairie. It's just something the city decided to put in. Okay. Because my other thing is, like, right Doug, behind... You want to clarify that? Yeah, maybe just a clarification on that. The designation that was made for, for a prairie and a nature center by the Common Council back in, I'm sorry, bad with dates, 2003, I mean, was something that was done unilaterally by the city. It's not... was never identified in any park and open space plan, any natural areas plan, DNR, uh, Regional Planning Commission. It was something that was done entirely on behalf and by the sole action of the city. And the action by the Common Council at their last meeting to carve out the lots and only the lots along Shepherd Avenue, those four, four potential lots, uh, removes those from that nature center, nature center designation. The rest remains. Thank you for that clarification. So how much is, how, what is the square footage area of the lots and that's taken away from that nature area? Oh, All four lots are about 1.2 acres. Of, and we'll get the acreage of the property. The frontage is about 13, of the thirteen point four cross on each. And there, if my eyes are good, maybe one hundred and thirty-five deep. So the entire parcel is thirteen point four acres. The the four lots are about a little over one point two acres in total. Okay, and then I just have um, so. In the last six months, there have been two homes that back up that are in front of that area um, that sold, and they were being sold. And in the description from Shore West or whoever was selling them was that this is a nature area and nothing can be built back here. So I'm just curious about that. Also, like, where did does that come from? Were they being told that by somebody or a realtor can put anything they want into a sales listing? Okay. Yeah, and, and maybe the owners told them that, and maybe they misunderstood it. But again, there was no legally binding thing from okay. the city back in all three. And then are they planning on putting a road? When they put those four homes there, are they going to connect a road no. going out to Shepherd? No? no. Okay, because there, I thought maybe in the map They're it. still officially mapped, but okay. there's no intentions that I've ever heard that they're going to put those roads Okay. Somewhere. And then... Um, I was heard something about the soil samples that they weren't taken yet. Are they going to be taken before they build there to make sure? That will be up to the school, much like they did with the other lot. They, I, they had another lot somewhere in the city, and they did the soil samples, and they went, it's not a good lot to build, and then they ixnated the other. So there's not like a code or something if, on that that you have to do that if you're going to build you just kind of no they they do that yeah they have to they do that okay. it's in their best interest to do that okay i mean the last thing they want to do is dig down there and find out they're on a natural spring okay and then my last thing was um why <laughs> there is so much land in oak creek can you just build those houses somewhere <laughs> else why yeah. do they have to go right but, there again it, <laughs> it, it kind of came from our our budgeting you know i and again, I'm, I'm getting kind of off topic, but the city has a lot of challenges budget-wise to keep our services up, and, you know, we are growing. We've had 11... Our taxes did get raised. Hang on, I got the floor, okay? So we have a budget to keep to run the city for protective services, streets, trash pickup, all those good things that we enjoy, our parks, 
our prairies, all that stuff has to be maintained. We got to pay our employees, the whole thing. So we have money. Over the last eight years, we've had levy restraints, which really stop us from capping our taxes short of growth. Okay? So, so basically, we've been flat with our revenues. Everything's flat. Well, inflation takes things up, the price of gas for police cars, and you name it, operating costs just go up. And it's getting harder and harder to maintain that. And we have revenue ca- uh, spending caps, too. We, we can only spend so much, and we get money back from the state. If we go over that, they start to penalize us by not giving us enough the, the money that we sent up there. So it gets complicated. So as, as we go through budgets, we're always looking for ways to be leaner. And whether it comes from employee benefits, not hiring new employees, things of that nature, we've gone about everywhere we could. So we started to look at inventory of things we have, like outlots. You know, you probably see this in your neighborhood, an odd piece of land that the city owns, and we come out and mow it a few times a year. Well, if we can eliminate a couple hundred of those citywide, we, we start to save some money. So we started to look at lots that we had potential to put homes on because the one thing that really drives some revenue growth for us is homes. And uh, so we decided to look, and these were four candidates. And we're looking at other lots throughout the area too. We're trying to spur development, and we're actually starting two new subdivisions this year in other areas. And I'm sure, while well, I can tell you there's one in my area and the people that are adjacent to it are not happy about it because they've enjoyed a farm field for a long time. But quite frankly, if the economy wouldn't have pooped out back in 08, it would have been built out years ago. So, you know, they, they kind of got a stay of execution just due to the economy. So some of this has to do with economics. It's not like we're targeting a neighborhood going, boy, let's go upset these people and you know, ruin their way of life. We're not trying to do that. We're, what we're trying to do is build and improve the city, give people an opportunity to come down here and live and enjoy it just as we do. Okay, then my last concern yes. was, I know you addressed the um, sewer issue and the drainage, and you said when they build the new homes, it'll go into the retention pond and that will all be figured out. But will that all be figured out for the new homes so they don't flood? and then it's going to go into our retention pond and put more water in there, causing us to flood. Or is that, did I, you know, I you're, you're, it, you're fixing this, you're, you're doing something about the sewer systems coming out of the new homes going into the retention pond or however their drainage is going. But do you not like look at the whole picture, not, not saying rudely, but of how that's going to affect the existing homes yes um there is no storm sewer per se that's being designed for these four lots it's all draining over the ground and through the ditch it does go to the pond it is adding more water to the pond from that runoff the ponds were originally sized for this whole area to be developed so it was always included in there for this to be developed not going to say that it's not going to flood you don't think that needs to be like reevaluated, or you know, make sure that that won't overfill and cause our homes to flood. Can that the, be reevaluated? Well, and the re- calculation was done for that entire area. You see, if the roads went in and eighteen homes went in. Okay. That that, that was. I guess the I'm just you know. I in. hope it doesn't happen. Is kind of scary right. to me. Keep in mind, right now, that whole prairie area goes back to that pond anyway. I mean, it does, but there's, you know, you have all the ground we, to We understand that. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate when those storms hit and, and people flood and, you know, but I, you know, why the sewers backed up and bubbled up, I don't, they just couldn't handle that, that amount of rain we had that time in the city. Or we had significant blockages within our sewers. No, no idea. You know, um, if it was an early spring storm and sometimes you, people don't, pick up their leaves and things like that, you get obstructions. We used to have that quite a bit over in uh, the Willow Heights subdivision. Okay, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Hi. 
I'm Johanna Skravanek. I live at 9956 South Austin Street in Oak Creek. I was wondering if you could put the map up again of the um, the city, the roads and that you had up previously. Uh, maybe Tim's work or Terry's working on it. I want to show you where I live, and I want to I want to bring up something that ever, no one wants to hear about, and it's climate change. And I think this is part of what's happening with our flooding. <clears throat> now, I live, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, there's Cindy Lane. It, it goes down to Austin Street and then to Robert Court. We live the second house from Robert Court facing west. When there is a storm, all the water from the, the subdivision west of us comes down Cindy Lane like a river, and I am not exaggerating. It ripped up the sod from my neighbor and floated it all the way down to the end of Robert Road. <clears throat> we were out there trying to keep the sewer clear of this debris but it didn't help because it all bubbled up. And I think that it's going to get worse. And I, I also think, I don't know where there's another retention pond except that one. And that one retention pond, it, it services a huge area. And I just do not think that it just does justice to our uh, community. I, I just don't think it's big enough anymore. Doug? And just maybe to put some perspective on it, uh, you're talking about the, the four lots, uh, about 1.2 acres, which in itself, 91% of that, that property of that nature center is staying exactly as it is. And let's take that even further. Of those four lots of that 1.2 acres, the city has maximum, and keep this in mind, maximum impervious coverages of 40%. So the most anyone would develop would be impervious and allowed to be 40%. That comes out to a half an acre, which is less than 4% of that entire site that's increasing the stormwater. And, that, and I'm, I'm not the engineer. I'm not going to tell you that, how that affects the stormwater pond. But other than to, to show you that this is being designed in such a way to be the least impactful upon the neighborhood, while still preserving 91% of that nature center so the kids can still play, the still, kids can still fish. You know, there's still be abundant nature there. This is, this is a... a, a a means of preserving that area uh, and a means of, quite honestly, paying to maintain that area and also providing for some additional um, objectives that are in the city's comprehensive plan with respect to uh, additional areas for single-family development and developing relationship with the school district. So I, you know, I, from the perspective of, you know, it's naturally, uh, you know, it's a little, you're a little bit nervous and when you see, oh my gosh, they're developing houses in that community, when you think of it from that perspective and from the perspective of, yes, in a sense, you're correct that the, the street pattern does allow for upwards of 12 lots there. I think 16 lots somebody mentioned. That's not what we're doing. And I don't believe it was ever or is ever the intent of this, this council to develop that into a subdivision. But it's a, it's a means of preserving the environmental integrity of that, that nature area, while at the same time providing, providing additional opportunities and partnerships or additional single family development and with the school district. So, you know, I, 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 I trust our engineering department uh, and I, I, I have no reason not to. Uh, the numbers say this works. And I, I think you'll be, at the end of the day, you'll see that this is not as impactful as you may think it is. And, you know, we're certainly uh, here to, to, if you have any questions about the process and if there are things we can do to make that uh, less impactful, we'll certainly consider those. But it kind of is what it is. And there was, a, there was a policy decision by this council that this accomplished a number of the objectives of the strategic plan uh, while still, again, preserving the, the open space, preserving that nature center. So that's, and, and I don't want to necessarily, and it already has kind of developed, delved into a discussion about the, the nature center. That's a policy decision by the common council. This plan commission is, is here. Do these lots meet the minimum criteria? They do. Uh, 
Uh, so from the perspective of the plan commission, as much as, as you'd like to say, have them say, no, we're not selling you those lots or we're not selling the school district lots, that's not their call. That is the dis discretion and the sole discretion of the common council. I just have one more yes, comment. Ahead, I don't think that we should have to absorb even, what, 4% did you say? Of how much you said it's going to affect? I don't think that Roughly we yes. can even absorb four more percent. That's my opinion. Sir, come on up. At start 495, you start in Lean Lane. The back of our yard is so low, and then there's an area that's open. Then there's that so-called swell where the water comes gushing down. The worst part, in a perfect storm, average, now you don't see it. You see it in the springtime. Over the fall and winter, millions of leaves accumulate back in the swale with the ice and the snow melt and the heavy thunderstorms we get in the springtime, it comes right back in our yard. It's not going anywhere. It's not adequate enough to take that. How can four more homes, being that much higher and we're this low, the water's going around the side, right? It's going to come right in our yard, and that's what's going to happen again. We're going to lose part of our yard, flood it out till God dries it up for us. It's not adequate enough. The elevation is too high for us. It's just too high, too much a difference. The water's going to go because of gravity towards the swale, towards the retention so what you're pond. Saying that's is right that behind our yard. We started building on Shepherd and went back and then stopped at some point. Engineering, when that subdivision went in, I can't answer why they engineered it the way they did mm -hmm. and, and why it was built in a low point the way it is. Uh, Willow Heights is somewhat the same way. Everything comes off the corner of 13th and Drexel, and it drains towards the creek, which is basically on 10th Street, and it makes its way through certain yards and what have you. There's, there's one homeowner in particular, and if you look at the top graphical map, everything kind of comes to him. Um, My sump pump continuous when we again, just get a moderate storm uh, back and forth. Unfortunately, we do have areas like that. I don't know why why it was designed that now way. Now it's in the springtime. No, the last the last lady get, said everything comes mm -hmm. off Fitzsimmons. Our home gets 70, 80 percent of the leaves from that whole area. A lot of them end up in the swale in the back there. It's just inundated. It's nothing's going anywhere. As I stated earlier, the leaves and debris hit play a huge part in in what happens and a lot of citizens don't pick up their leaves and they don't realize what's going on with it uh, it's, it's we difficult. are one of the few people who do yeah we get constantly all fall and early winter leaves in our yard when the wind blows from the west then the northwest then the north and we're tired of it nobody else cleans up their leaves I I know, and you know, we're as, tired of it. And as I walk around and I talk, and they just sit in their house and laugh. He he, he's picking up our leaves. You 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 don't know what goes on, and we've been doing it for like twenty five years. I, I get it. It's it's very frustrating. They're as, not doing their responsible work. As no, they're not. And and as I walked around, and, and I'm at events. Yeah. One of the questions I ask people is, would you be willing to pay, pay a small fee? For the city to hire a service and come and pick up the leaves so you take them to the road mm -hmm. um, maybe over the course of two yeah. months and would you be willing to have a special assessment on your tax for somebody to come and pick that up and i will tell you what probably 90 percent of the people said no mm -hmm. we were talking about a 30 to 50 dollar fee a year to do that oh i would be, vote in favor of that I, you're one of them i myself would do it but again people aren't always that responsible but it adds to the problems throughout the city and that's what i'm talking about taxing staff one of the biggest costs to a city is getting rid of leaves i mean we're talking close to a million dollars a city our size to dispose of leaves it takes a huge huge amount of budget not and then and the equipment wear and tear on the equipment and the people um it, it's it's really difficult to to do uh again we're hoping to be least impactful. The last thing we want to do, sir, is flood out your backyard. Um, again, we, we think these four lots uh, were buildable, uh, and it wouldn't affect when we when we took into a lot, account looking at them that they, they could accommodate with this drainage because all the drainage is, isn't supposed to go to the west. It's 
supposed to go to south to this, this uh, what do you call it, retention pond. That, that's the way we're engineering it. That's the way we're going to push it. Is there another way that the water will go besides in back of our lots? Or is there another way that the water will I, go? I, if I'm, we just, get, I'm not smart enough to answer that one. Nobody ever know. said we'd get these 100-year floods, but we've been getting them every year almost in uh, some area of the city. Well, you know, it. I kind of agree with that. The lady that was up here before, things are changing. Our winters don't start till later. Uh, it seems like our summers come later. Um, I, it's different. Uh, I know I sound like an old timer, but it's different. Mm -hmm. So um, I wish I could answer those for you, but I'm not capable of doing that. Okay, well, thank you. Maybe if people would cooperate with the leaves more and not have them go in that swale or in our yard or neighbor's yards, we wouldn't have that much problem. Hey. But in, it's the worst part is in the spring when the snow is still there and then we get a heavy thunderstorm. Everything just comes back. It's hard. You know, we have it with grass clippings and things like that, too. And believe me, our zoning guy, that guy is just inundated with calls year-round, mm -hmm. whether it's removal of snow, leaves, yeah. grass. You name it. Well, we'll trust you and hopefully... You will do the right thing, and, and God will bless us. I appreciate that. And, again, I, I have to agree with our director. Uh, we have a really good engineering department. Mm -hmm. uh, in most cases, you know, we really get a lot of doom and gloom scenarios of what's going on, and they, they really do their best to improve it. Um, so we're hoping that everything is right and, and up to par on this one. Well, if it starts flooding, I'll just be calling the city more than I do. Let them know that they have to come and clean that up. Or it's going to flood everything. Yeah, and, and again, in some cases, you know, the, the lady said, it, you know, it comes flying down from Sin, Cindy down from Fitzsimmons. Um, I don't know why it ain't being caught at Fitzsimmons. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. You know, I mean, these subdivisions were put in. Mm -hmm. People saw, you know, they saw off their farmlands and they mm -hmm. went in years ago. We're just all vulnerable to Mother Nature, and that's why we, we're She's here. She's always trying to take we're back her really land, concerned. even if you have title of it, you know. They're always growing back weeds and stuff and everything. It's always grabbing it back. So. Okay, if you okay. say it's going to be adequate drainage, on your word, we'll listen to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to speak? Yes, sir. Come on up. Uh, my name is Dave Greathouse. I live at 500 East Robert Road. I've lived there 44 years. I live right next to Carol, and I agree with everything she has said. I think the one thing we're overlooking right now is engineering has said that pond was designed for all these other houses to be built. Uh, that may be the fact 20 years ago. But right now, I think it's a very delicate balance what that retention pond can handle in a heavy rain. Uh, mainly from the fact that if you go there and look, what, what's, what goes in the pond has to be evacuated, and that is being omitted right now. Evacuation is a real issue. Walk on the other side of the road. The problem we had before that retention pond was built, there was a drainage ditch full of cattails, grass. The DNR would not allow the city to go down and, and excavate it yeah, to, to make the water uh, flow. Yeah. Look on the other side. You've got million-dollar houses sitting on the other side of Shepherd Avenue, and there's a drainage ditch coming under the road. That's supposed to take the water out. It's all filled up with cattails. It's all filled in. It's not going to accommodate the water coming out of the retention pond when you have a huge inflow of water. It may, it may be designed to take a certain amount, but you're not having water go out of the pond. And I think that's the Achilles heel we have in this situation. And it's only going to get worse unless that drainage ditch and the other side is opened up and cleared out. And I don't see that happening. And now we're saying, oh, only four houses. But I could, it's a very delicate balance right now of putting more water into that retention pond. Like I, said, I have a standby generator I run. I, I have constantly in, in you, ready to be used. If our power goes out, our, the storm starts backing up, or we start having water come out, you know, out of our sump pump, and it starts running constantly. But I think if you look at the other side of that street, and you see that, that ditch, you may have some reservations about what's going on here because the water's not going to be eliminated from that pond in a heavy, heavy downpour. And a hundred year floods are now 10 year floods. They're not hundred year floods, they're 10 year floods. Thank you. So that was mine. Thank you. 
Um, any, well, we're not really in a public hearing, but anyone else? Come on up, sir. Harry, can you assist him with microphone, please? And we need you on tape because they, they have to write up the minutes. I'll, I'll start. I, it'll probably pick up. Uh, name and address, so. James Schultz, 410 East Robert Road. Okay. Uh, just a few houses down. All of us suffered a lot as a group when this place opened. Um, I came to this group in 1997. I, I worked, when you talk about the quality of our engineering department, I worked with Phil Biermeister uh, when we were finding out the detention pond and so forth. Went down to the DNR myself, talked to some people down there. Uh, Phil was instrumental. And, and getting something done for the first time in a long time. Um, the problem is, I, I, I'm bothered by something you say when I look at that map. And you say, the map has got the street layout shown on it. And if somebody comes in and says, we want to build houses there, you got to sell them the lot. No, we don't have to. No, they, they're just officially planned streets oh, okay. uh, for connectivity. We always have those those plans in place. Um, whether uh, we right. want to act on it is solely the discretion of council. Why isn't that drawing kept up to date? You, you mentioned that um, you know, that we don't intend to do anything more as far as selling lots. Why are those roads still shown on there? Uh, why why isn't designated a well, the cost of up updating the drawings, and usually we do it when oh, we that upgrade. Doesn't cost that when we much, no, yes, there's a cost to everything we do. I worked sir. in nothing, the planning department for over forty no, nothing, years. Nothing's free. We still have to go through the act and record it. But going forward, I'm, I'm going to hand this over to Doug in a second. We go off the comprehensive plan. So as we update the city plan as it develops, much like this property, uh, things change. So then that's usually when we so, act. So we get settled down the drain, so to speak, no pun intended, so that eventually somebody can build here and make things worse for us? It, no, it still has to come through. It's it's just not a rubber stamp. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't characterize that in any way, shape, or form no. as the city putting that entire acreage up for, for sale for development. That's just no. simply not the case. And with respect to the official map street pattern, there really I, I, was no need to amend that given the fact that it was under city ownership. It's, it's certainly on a list of, there's a number of street patterns throughout the city that are old and in many cases obsolete. And as we run across those situations, we'll take steps to address those. But uh, the fact that there's a road pattern there does not compel the city to either sell that to anyone or to develop those roadways. The bottom line is I feel we're, we're gonna be back here next year or the year after, and it's gonna be not four buildings, it's gonna be 12, 16, whatever. They can squeeze into that. Uh, developers don't care about what happens after they leave, get sign off and get rid of the, the properties. Oh, you're right in some cases, but here's think about this realistically. If we were going to develop this right now, why would we take it at only four lots? Well, because and, Liz, I have anything. the floor, sir. Why would we go through all this over four lots and then come through and get dragged through it again for the other 12? I would just rip the Band-Aid off and do it all. The intention was to just get some lots on the tax rolls that we're currently taking that aren't very impactful. That, that's all it is. And we're selling some out lots, as I said, throughout the city. There's a few places within the city. Damn about the property owner that is not dealing with this problem. All you, all you talk about is Again, if we wanted this developed, we would have taken the whole thing. There's not an intent to do this. Now, again, if a developer came in 
decided, oh, I'd like to put 12 homes in there. Uh, we'd, sp we'd spin around, engineering would come through it and say, you need a whole sewer system, you need to put in the roads, the whole thing. Again, I'm going to get crushed here for economics. A developer is not going to find it worth his while to do those 12 lots, put in millions of dollars worth of infrastructure to try to recoup that on those lots. It just isn't economically feasible. They have to do it by density, and it doesn't exist here. So, again, there is not an intent from the city to take that away. As Doug said, it's, what is it, 6%, 4%. Impervious area. What, what, That's oh, going less, in. Less than 4 Right. I, I, I realize you guys are upset. I get that. I, I would I would venture to say this, and I'm, and I'm just basing it on probably the age of your subdivision. Your subdivisions went in without a retention pond in the first place, which was probably the first mistake way back when, whenever them homes were built in the 70s or 80s or whenever that happened, because that pond went in sometime in the 2000s. So you guys were living with this problem long before that prairie ever existed or that pond ever existed. So, I mean, we're going back a long way. Now, it probably just drained out in the farm fields and nobody cared back in the day. Then Quail Run got built, probably took away some, and, and, and things of that nature. But again, it is, it's, it's about the city is a growing thing. It was growing back in 1955 when we started it, and it continues to grow. Just the way it is. You can't grow, you can't compete. You, you can't keep your taxes up, you can't provide for your schools. You have to be growing. You have to be on the microphone, sir. Uh, I'll give you an example of mistakes. When my house was being built, I was one of the few people who hired a, a licensed landscaper to come over to do the grading. Uh, he came in uh, the house and said, I can't drain the, the backyard. If, if I tried going to the, the uh, grading plan, he says, I'm going to park it in your basement first. He says, your house is eight inches too low. The sidewalks are three inches too high. So we're, we've got a foot that we're, we're trying to ma make up for. We can't do it. There just is not enough there to, to, to correct the situation. And, and it just went on and on and on. We kept seeing these mistakes over and over and over again. Finally, there were some, some things that would improve the, the problem, but for all intent and purposes, uh, it was an unsolvable problem. Uh, it, it wasn't easy. It's easy to go ahead and sell more properties and collect more revenue. But what about the revenue that I lost? And all, a lot of these other people that are here and had to have their homes redone because of Again, the flooding. I can't, I can't speak for engineering mistakes of the past. And You're the mayor. You have to I, the I am the mayor, but I can't speak for an engineering problem that went on back in the 70s when I was in grade school. You have so, an opportunity to correct it. Did, you have an opportunity to have a sweep one. Why I got to worry about now and I can easily get my generator started in the basement for the next year. You guys, you guys are looking, you're not, you're not looking for what you don't have. I don't know who you're looking for. You, you have something to say, sir? Come on out. Uh, man in the back, please. Name and address, please. 65 East Oak Lane. So we live right on the pond. Name, please. Matt Iglo. Um, there seems to be a lot of I don't know, maybes, I think so's going on, especially in engineering. And uh, it's pretty worrying. And like you said, you have a chance to make it right. And who are you representing? We are representing all the citizens here. This body does, and so does the Common Council. Our engineering department goes off engineering standards that are approved by the state. 
They go off national engineering. I mean, these are accredited people. They're professionals that are doing it. When you hear the, I'm not sure, this and that, that's why they have 100-year floodplains or flood plans. Nobody knows when it's going to happen. We had two massive floods within this city. I had, I had a family flooded out in my neighborhood when I was an alderman. Twice within three years, just, just as you people described and went through. This was the and neighborhood it, it is, flooded. It is not fun. It, there, there were other homes affected. I, I'm bringing up the one, but as I told you, everything ran down this way too. They lived in peace for probably 35 years until this happened. It, it happens. They're going off engineering stats. It's, it's, nobody has a crystal ball to say there's a 100% lock that nothing's ever going to happen. It, it, it just doesn't happen that way when you, when you engineer something as best you can. Whether that, it's that's it's again modes. maybes you're saying you know you say you can't predict it but then you do it to the best of our ability they engineer it not to happen and that's what they're doing here and you also um, stated what the real plan of this is I mean this is just the beginning I I can see this going further beyond this and you said you stated what the idea is revenue. No. The, the revenue, you it, have to grow. We it's have to grow. We do. The, the plan of it was, as I explained out of budget, was to get rid of any surplus property to cut our costs of maintenance, okay, and either pass it to the homeowner if it's connected to their, their lots or if it can serve a business or home. And this one fit the criteria of both, okay? And we're going to continue to do that because we have to make ends meet so we can service your but garbage, protect you with police you and fire, you say and provide you all the services you need. But what is the rest of that after that 4%? What is that 96% surplus land? So when you need more revenue, you will be selling that I don't property. think you were listening. When oh, I, I heard you about no. the building and not being... I got the floor. All right? I explained to you for a developer to come in yes, and put in another 12 homes... You realize the cost of roads, curbs, lights, yes. transformers. Do you think he can pull the lot price he needs to make money on those 12 lots? What do you think the probability is of that? It's not exactly about that it's guy. Like, it's exactly but about that It's not about that guy. It's and about that's why that land guys. will sit. But you guys, that's where it sits. That's why nobody will buy it from us. That's why it's and, a prairie. And, and maybe just to put a, a fine point on this, a decision as to whether or not to sell these lots is not a decision by this plan commission. It's a decision by the Common Council. The question before the plan commission tonight is, do these lots conform to the standards for the RS3 zoning district? Yes, they do. So these lots will be drained directly. Like, they won't even be connected anywhere else. They'll be directly into where that connection of Robert Street would be, that add-on. That's a river, essentially. That drains directly Add on to Robert Street. That, you mean that planned road of Robert? Yes, that's actually a river where the, all the water of the whole, essentially the neighborhood of uh, north, the side of the neighborhood goes. And is that what you're adding to then? Is that where all the drainage from those four lots? Because it's a good distance above. The drainage above. is supposed to go south to the, the tension pond. And but it's gonna the, because it's gonna go west because that's where half that, of the drainage. Yeah, the the front half of the yard will drain out to Shepherd. That'll drain down the ditch to the pond. The rear half of the yard will drain to that river, to the pond. Hmm. So, just the whole area is gonna drain into that retention pond. And then I would go with the, yes, that retention pond is not big enough. I see it every morning and. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, that's all. Okay, thank you, Matt. All right, anybody else? I was just going to mention that, you know, down the road, we, could we look at uh, wherever this is draining to to make sure that you know, something doesn't need to be cleaned up or where the cattails well, are further I, down? I think, that was, I think that was a great point because that, that is very much part of the problem is, is maintenance, and we've talked about that. Uh, some of it does fall with the DNR. We had a crick through Willow Heights, and I 
I keep bringing up Willow Heights because I think it's very comparable. Uh, we had to get DNR permission because the cattails would get in the creek. And uh, until basically we ended up redoing a road, which really opened things up and, and, and just changed the dynamic of the whole subdivision. Uh, the flooding went away, but uh, that was a long time coming and, and took a lot. But yet the cleanup is essential, without a doubt. Um, I can't answer if that's a navigable waterway and we need DNR per permission to get in there or if it's a city issue. That I don't know but about the drainage digits. We could ask uh, engineering to take a look at that. Right? For sure. For sure. It, sh it should be one of the things that we're trying to do. But uh, as I said, as, as the departments are trying to manage, they're doing much more on, on much less. It's a tough equation. Uh, come, come on up, ma'am. You got to come up. You got to be on the microphone, ma'am. Sell that piece of land to the state and make it a regular prairie, so it'd be a natural. So nobody could touch it. You guys wouldn't have to listen to all our crabbing, and they would probably be able to take care of it more because they're the state. Is there a way of doing that or no? Um, I just wonder. The state's selling off surplus land now. You hear about, you know, they're selling off land. I don't want to speak for the state, but you're probably better off dealing with us and the state. Um, I don't think they'd have any interest in it. But Not in that little piece I, of land. Again, I, I wouldn't want to speak for the state. I just thought I'd ask because I didn't know anything. No, not Maybe bad. if we made, we can make some money, sell it to the state, we'll take <laughs> care of it. <laughs> so, come on up before I, I signal for the motion. All right, it's just really quick. If this is supposed to have been done in a common council meeting, how come we weren't invited to that? It hasn't, and, it hasn't happened yet. It comes through planning first. Okay, so then we need to be invited to that. Uh, and then um, would a petition help? I mean, can I start a petition from our neighborhood to stop this, and would that help? And if so, how do I do that? Point, point of clarification. The decision to exclude that area from the Nature Center has been made by the common council. Then this, why this, 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 Okay, yeah, I'm, let me finish, please. This is a recommendation to the Common Council as to whether or not to create those lots. And the Plan Commission has separate rules regarding the notification than the con Common Council does. And in, in, in fact, the notifications that you receive for this meeting and any Plan Commission meeting are, you know, are not required by law. This is a service that the city preserve. Uh, gives to the residents, and it's a good service, and I wouldn't suggest modifying that. It's just that the, the procedures for the Common Council are a little bit differently, and they don't, as a matter of course, unless it's a public hearing, notify residents within 300 feet. The Planning Commission does. Thank you, Doug. Okay, and then would a petition help, and how do I start that? I do not know how you start a petition, and whether it would help would depend on the opinion of the Common Council members. I don't vote on it unless I vote tie, so it would be up to the individual aldermen of the district. When is the next meeting? Uh, when's the next meeting? Two weeks? So the Common Council meets the first and third Tuesdays of each month. Thank so you. 21st, I think. Am I right? Is that uh, when this is going to no, be on it for it, Common Council? I don't know if it would make it. I don't know what the CSM will be on the 21st or not. It could. I mean, my advice, and maybe this is just a commercial of her, uh, the city has, if you go to our city's webpage uh, under the Community Development Department, it's got a thing called, it's got a, got a link to a, a piece of software called Zoning Hub. And if you notice on the notice that you did receive for this meeting, you'll have that link there. If you sign up for that, you will receive notice of every uh, action that's taken with respect to the CSM in your email box. So I would encourage, if that's the way you want to follow politics, you want to want to follow what's happening at the Planning Commission. Uh, uh, you can do that in that regard. You can check on the agendas uh, with the city clerk's office on the city's website. So there's a number of ways. This, we're trying to make this, you know, whether you believe it or not, as transparent as possible and easy as possible for people to get involved in the process. And unfortunately, that's a little bit different from the perspective of the Planning Commission versus the Common Council. But it is, again, believe it or not. We are trying to get citizen input uh, as far as the process for all of this. And uh, I think the Planning Commission, while they certainly uh, uh, can take that into account as far as the history of the area, they've got a pretty prescribed role here in terms of 
for their recommendation with respect to the creation of these four lots. And then one last statement. Yes. Um, if you keep saying that you don't know why this happens and, you know, with the, as far as the flooding. the flooding and the city engineering, my last final statement, and I sit down after this, is why aggravate it? All right. Uh, with that. Oh, wait. I have a couple questions. Oh, go ahead. Okay. So... For the items on page two, I think this is for Gary. Do we have to reconcile these five items? Do we have to do this? No, that's a point of information for the plan commission. So these items don't have to be, for lack of a better term, compliant? No, they're okay. simply pieces of information to consider. Okay. And then my second question, just for clarity. So for the residents that are concerned, are there all the ones you identified as possible options for this reason? So do the residents, do they have to do anything for this? Just to give them a little feedback in how it can help the city. Are you referring to my request for the dredging? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, that would be something that... Do, do they have to make a request? No, no, that's something. I mean, if a resident wants to put in a request, they can do it at any time. Okay. You know, and our street department goes out and, um, of course, makes a determination of, of cleaning it out. If if it's ours to clean out, if it's state, if it's county, uh, depending on where it is and what the factors are. Uh, but they can make the request any time. But the alderman can definitely, any alderman can make the request. I have just a question. Yeah, go Brian. ahead, Fred. On the drainage of those four lots, could that drainage go all to Shepherd? Could that drainage be set up to handle it so we can keep it away from going west? Even if it goes to Shepherd, it still goes to the pond? I, so. I understand that, but what I'm saying is trying to keep it from going back towards those homes. Not the way the contour is set up. The yeah. land out there. Do any grading plans that would shift that? Without changing that whole area. Perhaps in clarification yeah. of that, you I thought I heard you mention that the front half of those lots would go out to Shepherd. Correct. Oh, there's like a high point. The way that they're they're graded, um, the building pad. So there's a high point and midpoint of the building pad. So that drains to the front. Rear yard drains out to the back. And they drain out that swale that comes down there to the pond. It's a thought. Yeah, so. I know. It's. You know, I agree. When I had my lot done, I had a professional grader come out and do what they can with that Willow Heights subdivision work. It was very oddball heights. After they added on, my subdivision was added on after the people were there spent five or six years on the site, and they added on. And it was kind of the same thing. I, I just... Out of sheer dumb luck, I picked a high lot. You know, and, and it eventually it all drains to the backyard. And there's swales between the yards, which take it to the storm sewer system. So, same concept in every scenario we have to do that. So, um, that's what they're shooting for here. Other than a creek, they got a pond. So, the, you know, the grades just kind of like this. Anything else? I have one additional yes. question. So in in addition to where the pond is going to go, the dredging, dredging. dredging. Where, the, where the pond drains to, where, drain. where it drains out of the retail and where it does the pond further, whatever direction it goes, they are going to look at um, checking to see if anything needs to be dredged, as they had mentioned, uh, because of a cattail. Okay. And, and because of the description of overflow, for lack of a better term, that happened. Is there anything else that you would recommend to the citizens to look at for this excess water that we're kind of getting? Because dredging is, if I'm understanding you correctly, is below this retail. 
expensive. Well, it's right. to help empty it. Oh, to help so, empty it. so that okay. when it's filling up, it can keep up with the water that's going into it. It can drain as fast as it's, in theory, as it's filling or however that works. Well, I it mean, detains I'm the water an and then it just so. bleeds out over time. It should lower. Am I correct in that, Brian? Correct. And then over time, so in a big rain, everything goes to the pond, pond swells up, and then it just drains out through the ponds and makes its way back to eventually the level. So if Whoop. that area is filled with debris, it won't correct which could potentially cause their it, well it could cause the pond not to bleed off at a rate that it's been engineered at. i don't know if bleed out is the right word but you know what i mean drain so thank you okay all right um if so motion on where are we e e 5e Oracle moved that the plan commission recommend to the common council that the certified survey map submitted by the city of Oak Creek for the property at 1002 South Shepherd Avenue be approved with the following conditions. Number one, that the entire parcel is included on the map prior to recording. Number two, that the signature page is updated to include the acceptance of the public right-of-way dedication. And number three, that all technical corrections, including but not limited to spelling errors, minor coordinate geometry corrections, and corrections required for compliance with the municipal code and Wisconsin statutes are made prior to recording. It's a call skill second. Roll call. Anna, no. Dunstan, no. I. Rilla, I. Lorak, I. Kavich, I. Vizikowski, I. Dippert, I. Chandler, no. Okay, uh, moving on. 5F, uh, landscape plan review. Review of landscape plan submitted by Dustin. Adasky, St. John's Properties for the property at 140 East Rawson Avenue. Carrie? The request is for a review of a landscape plan for this property at 140 East Rawson Avenue. Plan commissioners may recall that this was part of a larger review of a multi-building, multi-tenant office and industrial development on the property back in February of 2017. Uh, because there were concerns raised during the meeting by residents on the south side of Rawson Avenue regarding headlight trespass, the plan commission required that the revised landscape plans be brought back to the commission for approval. So that's what we're here for this evening. On the screen right now is what was presented for plan commission review back in February of 2017. These plans were also included in your packets for further review. And what's on your screen right now is what's being proposed for landscaping. There were some slight variations. There were additional plants that were added along the southern sides of the buildings and on the entrance elevations in several locations. This occurred on the west side of buildings A and C and on the east side of building B. There were no changes from the original landscape plan proposed along Rawson Avenue, so there was nothing changing along the public right-of-way. The eastern island between the drive access for buildings A and B was slightly reconfigured, but there were no changes to the number or types of plants proposed from the original plan. Uh, there was a turnaround pad added to the northwest corner of the site, but there was no change to the proposed plantings in that area. While this is an improvement, there are some areas where staff concedes there could be some additional plantings added, but that would also be in the Rawson Avenue right-of-way, uh, which is currently going through the process of being determined is, as the county is uh, looking into their excess land. Uh, so that exchange has, that conversation has not been completed yet. There is an opportunity, if that turns into excess land, that there could be landscaping proposed there uh, just a suggestion. If there are any other modifications, that would be up for the plan commission to determine. There is a suggested motion that the plan commission approves the landscape plan submitted by Dustin Atelski of St. John Properties, Inc. for the property at 140 East Rawson Avenue with the condition that all conditions of plan, commu plan commission approval from February 28, 2017 remain in effect. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, before we turn it over to the commission, anybody wishing to speak on this? Come on up, sir. 
Uh, I think you heard me say it a number of times. Name and address, please. <laughs> yes, my name is Mike Pihelski. I live at uh, 251 East Rawson Avenue, which is right across the street uh, from the project. And uh, just like to start out with this, uh, as the city says, times are changing. Um, I've lived here all my life. The house I live in across the street with my grand grandparents and my great grandparents actually had a farm on this property here somewhere, and I had great great grandparents that this goes back. So have some roots here, and as uh, things do change, and uh, at that property across the street, which used to be a a farm homestead, and in uh, what was the Hydrix place, and now it's becoming a <laughs> quite a quite a um, project. You know, so we we get it. Uh, we know things are changing, and and uh, and actually. Because it's right across the street from us, we did have concerns on how it will look at our perspective when we're, we're at on the, the other you, side. I think you guys were here so <clears throat> Right, we were, last, we were here the last time, when we, and that was, so as I, as I speak, the concern was back then as the elevation of the, of the land, and uh, I can see they, they're working on it, like, I don't know if you've been down there lately, in the last two weeks, but they're, they basically mowed well, my concern was they had, where the house used to be across the street was which was higher than my property coming through. They have eliminated that hill, and I, I guess I just I, I do you know is that property the way they're building kind of going to be the same elevation as Ross and Avenue is now? Do you, is there um, is well, that is what is that what they're doing? Because uh, that's kind of what it looks like, and that you know that would definitely solve a lot, you know. A lot of concerns about any you know light migration from carlites and stuff stuff like that. So because they're really bringing that level down. So I'm that's what I'm assuming they're kind of doing there. Well, I'm the wrong guy to answer that. Yeah. Brian's probably the best guy. <laughs> he I'm would yeah, throw I'm, it over to him. So if, if I can read these plans correctly here, um, basically where the driveway is for the frontage road. Yes. That elevation is about 156. Yes. And we got a building floor of 157 okay, for that so, center building so it's about a foot higher okay yeah that, right that's that's not a big deal so and you know naturally the uh from looking at the plans you know you can't really tell exactly you know what it it will look like when it's completed but the one big concern i have is that after this is all done and i'm sure it'll look nice that it's maintained because uh we uh when they put in the roadway uh, trucking firm yellow freight across the street from us, we saw all these beautiful uh, uh, designs of all the beautiful trees that were going to be there and how the thing was going to be maintained. Well, <laughs> you go go there. You know, you know. I don't have to say any more about that. You know how it looks. So that's that's our, our main concern. My main concern, I should say, is that it you know that it is. Hopefully, they maintain it so it looks, you know landscape then they cut the grass and keep replace the trees that do die and things like that and and because this is a huge a huge uh, project here there'll be a lot of lot of traffic here now and a lot of buildings and a lot of like i said a lot of changes for us but uh we're, we're hopeful that everything is uh is maintained and kept up and and as as things are going uh living here my whole life i am impressed of all the changes here, uh, Drexel Square is beautiful, and uh, you guys got a tough job. So you know people are <laughs> claiming on you all the time, but I just want to say, as a permanent resident, has been here all my life, plus my family's. I, I want to thank you for for that. So thank you. Well, thanks. It's yeah. kind of nice to hear tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Could have used that in an Oregon. Oh, that's okay. It happens. Come on up, sir. I'm a Pete Schumacher, 305 East Rawson, neighbor to Mike. Uh, I'm also happy, so this will be a good discussion. Um, just wanted to make it clear, we, we had the same concerns that Mike did about the headlights. It's very clear that with the elevation change, that's not going to be a problem. The headlights are going to go into the embankment, not into, into our house, so that's fine. So we're, we're fine with that, and the plan looks good. Uh, the only other thing I'll mention, which isn't specifically on the plan, but just maybe for the developers, that I have a little concern that when they add lighting for the parking lot and any other area lighting that it be properly installed and designed to minimize the uh, the, the offshoot to the southern side. So. Yeah, we, we do have codes there. Our electrical inspector approves the lighting plan, and they have cut-off shades. And, uh, we're able to regulate that light pollution. There. 
Okay. Well, good. Yeah, we're, it, it looks like it's a good, and, a good project. We're happy. And, and we're the, given all the options of what could go there. This looks like it's a pretty uh, good option. And if the place does get built and, you know, they got a street, uh, parking lot pole and catch a reflection, let us know. Uh, we usually go to the business owners and work with them. We've done it at Bayview and other places, too. So, again, we try to our, our best not to impact the neighbors as much as possible as things are changing. Okay, pretty good. Thank you. Thanks. Um, council. Fred? Oh, it looks good. Yeah, looks good. Chris? Greg? Don? Brian? Kristen. Okay. Uh, motion, please. Deeper moves that the Planning Commission approve the landscaping plan submitted by Dustin Atkins, St. John's property, or the property at 140 East Rawson Avenue with the conditions that all conditions of the Planning Commission approved for February 28th remain in effect. Is it called skills? Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Pete, were you up? I, okay. I just wanted to make sure. Greg brought it to my attention, and then Mike, we got you too. Okay, thanks. A little frazzled here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where were we? Is it called skills? All right. Uh, roll call. And I. John tonight. Laura Kai. Oh, go ahead. Laura Kai. We <laughs> gave a chai. Who's the golf PI? Snooper and I. Chandler I. Getting late. 5G. Uh, final plot. Review final subdivision plot submitted by Roger Johnson, Glen Crossing, LLC, for their proposed Glen Crossing edition number one, phase one subdivision located at 8400 South Nighthawk Trail. Pete? Pete. Did you come just to hang out? I've been sitting here for the last half hour thinking, why is he here? He just enjoys meetings. <laughs> Carrie. <laughs> Unless Pete wants to take over. <laughs> the proposal is a final plat for phase one of the Glen Crossing edition, number one. Line commissioners will call that this, recall that this was going to be developed in two phases. So this is phase one. They are nearly done with all of the public improvements. In fact, they're slated to be done within the next two to three weeks, and after which time uh, the engineering department will go out and certify that everything has been installed according to the plan. There are 23 new single-family residential lots ranging in size from 12,323 square feet up to about 24,840 square feet in phase one. Nighthawk Trail was extended south with a bump out for a future road improvement. And Rosewood Trail was also extended south and will be called South Rosewood Lane. And that also has a bump out for future road improvements for the next phase of the subdivision. There is also a new east-west road called West Morningside Lane, which connect connects the two extensions. Outlet 5, there was a small change. It increased in size from, or I'm sorry, it decreased in size from 2.17 acres to 1.7 acres. That contains the wetlands and floodplain. That will be dedicated to the city for drainage purposes. There is a 20-foot MMFD utility easement and a 20-foot sanitary sewer easement shown through lot, Outlot 5. And other drainage and utility easements are shown throughout the subdivision. There is a suggested motion that if the Plan Commission is satisfied with the proposal, with the conditions of approval, that there is a recommendation for the Plan Commission to recommend to the Common Council that the final plan for Glen Crossing Edition Number 1, Phase 1, Submitted by Roger Johnson, Glen Crossing LLC be approved, subject to conditions one and two. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Carrie. Um, anybody wishing to speak on behalf of the subdivision plot? No? If not, uh, commission. Jossie? Fred? Yeah, I just have a question about the floodplain on the east corner. Are, is, do we have a dimension? On that floodplain, how far it goes back into that development? So normally, it's plotted by the DNR that determines the flood fringe. And, and I'm just curious how far that would go back into that development. 
If I'm reading it correctly, yeah. it's supposed to be all contained on outlot five. I, I don't... The, the creek is east, east of the floodway. You're talking along the creek, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's all contained in outlot five. Uh, just lot five covers the whole thing. Yes. That's good. I'm Bob Fox. I'm, I'm one of the members of Glen Crossing. I'm also the surveyor of record of this project. And yes, the floodplain is all contained within outlot five along the floodway of the Oak Creek. So there's no part of the 100 year flood that um, is coming up on any of the lots on phase one here or phase two when we go into that one. I was just thinking of what we just recently went through with these people. Drainage and water and so forth. And in all transparency, we are going to build things in this field. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was just curious a little bit about, you know, does that kind of reach over a little bit into the other lots or is it just strictly that lot five? And, and that creek really is the back end of what comes out of Willow Heights that I addressed earlier. Um, and traditionally, that, that creek had problems. It, it had uh, other things going on. But again, some of that land I talked about that was sold in Willow Heights now was just floodway for when the creek expanded. Since then, the floodways changed because the creek has expanded. There's cattails are out. They, re, they redid the flow of the creek under the road. Long story short, we don't see near the flooding. The fire department, at times, we had a lock subdivision because it's improved greatly. So things change over time. But we did live with that for 25 years, 30 years. And um, again, back in the day, nobody cared because it was flooded. It was just, you know, I mean, it was just field. Um, but that creek was always designed with that buffer around it. Because the, even if you look at the existing homes uh, in the backyards, there's easements there for it. For that creek was always set to go another 20 feet on each side. I wanted to prevent further discussions from the public. <laughs> I appreciate that. I actually have one question. Yes, Carrie, Ms. you Stena. mentioned you mentioned that there was a public information meeting held for that. Was there any concern brought up from that? There was a preliminary plat meeting at which point the entire subdivision was reviewed. So phases one and two were all completely planned out, shown, platted. Um, and this is fairly close to, if not almost identical to, with the exception of just an outlaw change in size, what was presented for the preliminary plat. But there was no public concerns or the, anything that we need to know about? As I recall, there were no real concerns about flood issues. There were concerns about aesthetics and things like that. But, okay. but nothing major? That not that I off. recall. And okay. this, there was a subdivision to the north, and as you can see, Outlot 4 already has existing stormwater infrastructure that covers the, the subdivision to the north that's existing. So um, I don't recall any neighbors' concerns for flooding from that meeting. Anybody else? Fred, you, you, you done? I'm sorry. I'm good. I'm good with the flood plan. Okay. Chris? Good. Greg? Your area? Uh, it, it is my area, and I heard nothing from anybody around there. So. Yeah. Don? Oh. Brian? Um, just a couple things to open up an old wound here. Um, front yard setbacks. We're going with 30 feet? 35. 35? 35. I have it on the plat at 35. Of course, the zoning allows for 30-foot setbacks. On corner lots, we have a note on the plat that a house can limit its side yard setbacks to 30 within the zoning district, but the front yard still has to remain at 35. Which we is some discussions about that with the plumber. Which was the five foot yeah. change and from I guess the I original would just make sure you process. put that in your deed restrictions and make that very clear because we exactly. still get people who want to build to the city's setbacks as opposed to the deed restrictions. Yes. Okay. Um, the other thing, just a note for plan commission um, this is phase one phase two is being constructed at the same time the original hope was to get this done last year we're getting it done now we're really close we poured sidewalks today um, final lift asphalt should be going down here in a 
couple weeks to get things wrapped oh, up. Yeah, hopefully less. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have builders that are calling me, want to get going out here, so we're trying to push this process along a little bit. Thank you. It, they will be building soon. FYI, there was a small business journal article about uh, the subdivision, I think, today. What is the price range of the lots uh, and houses? They're going to be in the, you know, 100, 120. Some of them are a little bit more along the creek in there, those areas that are a half acre. So you're probably lots, looking at four to $700,000 house lot package. Yeah, probably going to be in looking at that range. One more point of clarification. There is a condition for recommendation um, that may actually get left off before it goes to Common Council based on timing of the public infrastructure improvements. Okay. So they may be in. They may be in, in which case that condition will go away. But so everybody is aware, we're putting it on for right now. Okay. Um, anyone else? Christina? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, motion, please, on 5G. Oracle moved that the Planning Commission recommend to the Common Council that the final plat for Glen Crossing Edition Number 1 submitted by Roger Johnson, Glen Crossing LLC, be approved with the following conditions. Number 1, that an escrow is provided to the city prior to recording the final plat to cover the costs of the final lift of asphalt on the road and street lighting until such time as it has been installed with certification by the Engineering Department. Details for this escrow should be coordinated with Assistant City Engineer Brian Johnston. Number two, that any technical corrections, including but not limited to spelling errors, minor coordinate geometry corrections, and corrections required for compliance with the municipal code and Wisconsin statutes are made prior to recording. Speed seconds. Roll call. Anna, aye. Johnson, aye. Rillo, aye. Lorik, aye. Kavich, aye. Wysikowski, aye. Speed aye. Chandler, aye. Okay. Uh, brings us to adjournment. Before we go, though, I think thanks are in order to our staff. A uh, rather long night, but I appreciate you guys being here, especially Pete, you know, providing some muscle quietly <laughs> over there. <laughs> and, and Mike Mike was back there, too. He had another long night with no speaking parts. But, I, again, thanks to our staff. Very well prepared. Tough subjects, people, uh, without a doubt. Uh, but, again, we're trying to do the right thing for everybody involved. So... Um, Thank you guys for your patience. Um, farmer's Market. Uh, we're coming up on the second half. Correct. So uh, what's special this week? We have watermelon and all a all, ton of different kind of melons, and all the orchards are in the Farmer's Market now. So Starting there, this week. There you have it. Highly recommend it. Nine to one. Uh, it is probably very quickly becoming a premier market here on the South Shore. Uh, soon to be one of the tops in southeastern Wisconsin. So please get out there and discover and celebrate Oak Creek. And now adjournment. Rillo moves to adjourn at 8.56. Two for seconds. Roll call. Anna, I. Johnson, I. Carillo, I. Lorik, I. Kavich, I. Musikowski, I. Super, I. Chandler, I. Thank you.